the professor. Uh, basically, he is working in the field of uh, spectroscopy using uh, uh, steady state as well as uh, time dissolved fluorescent spectroscopy as a tool, mainly fluorescent uh, conduction and Canadian absorption, and as well as now it, uh, recently he has started also uh, imaging. Uh, so, uh, Onindo is basically a versatile scientist in that sense, in terms of uh, physical chemistry as well as ultra fast spectroscopy. He's doing everything. And he's, his lab is one of the most equipped lab uh, now in India. Uh, <clears throat> he has also obtained a number of uh, awards like IIT Bombay Young Investigator Award, Young Researcher Award of Chemical Research Society of India, uh, GV Vakode Memorial Award from Indian Chemical Society, uh, De Departmental Award of Excellence in Teaching in IIT Mumbai. Uh, bronze medal of CR, uh, CRSI, Chemical Research Society of India. He is also a fellow of National Academy of Science uh, in India since 2017, uh, 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 that is the Allahabad Academy. And he is also uh, a editorial board member uh, of Journal of Physical Chemistry, one of the most prestigious journal uh, in the area of uh, physical chemistry, from uh, which is published from recently. All these things I, uh, in, uh, in, uh, I invite uh, Onindo to uh, deliver his lecture. Please, Onindo. Thank you, Nirudha, for the kind introduction. And I thank uh, the organizers for having given me this opportunity to well visit Keshiari virtually. And this is even more enjoyable because of the chairman of the present session. As Nirudha has said, he was uh, the senior most student when I joined. And so he was uh, one of my gurus, actually, who uh, got me initiated into this field. And uh, we have uh, many memories. Uh, of interesting things that we have done together as students. He himself is a very, very highly uh, acclaimed scientist. He has more than 100 papers in ACS journals, which is a remarkable feat that uh, not many of us will be able to achieve. So it is really a pleasure and an honor to be here today. Uh, I'd actually planned to say uh, something different, but then uh, in the last moment, I changed my mind and I went back to uh, the story that I uh, really like to tell uh, most of the time. So uh, when I say ultra fast route, uh, the first question that might come to one's mind, especially for students, is what is ultra fast and uh, why do we even need to bother about them? A lot of people have asked me this question. When I said ultra fast means femtosecond or picosecond, they say, what can possibly happen in such a small time? And you want to do a reaction, it takes minutes or hours, right? But then the point is, as I'm going to show you very briefly, uh, very fundamental chemistry does happen in this time regime. Of course, if you want to measure uh, an ultra fast event, then you need to have some kind of a stopwatch that will allow you to do so. As you know, uh, our uh, mobile phones have, some, have a stopwatch which can go down to maybe tens of milliseconds if you got a good one. Uh, the stopwatch used in Olympics can go down to millisecond. But millisecond for us is ultra slow. As you see in this famous arrow of time taken from the Nobel lecture of Professor Ahmed Zuel of 1999, um, mankind's ability to measure faster and faster and faster processes has increased exponentially from say 1960s onwards with the advent of lasers. As you see, uh, microsecond was available between 1949 and 1953. Millisecond was available from 1940s onwards. So, pretty classical. But nanosecond came only in 1960s. Pico capability to measure picosecond time came in 1970. Capability to measure femtosecond came in 1980. Of course, for many of the students, 1980 might sound uh, prehistoric because you're not even born then. What I'm telling you is that even this arrow of time is 20 years old, so it is not complete. Sometime during the time, of the turn of the century and millennium, uh, the attosecond barrier was broken. And now one can actually determine uh, attosecond time if one wants. But most of us chemists would be happy if we can measure them to seconds. That for us is the ultimate ultra fast time scale. And I'll tell you why. To do that, let us go back to something that most of us would be comfortable with being chemistry students. Let us ask the question, as a student, as a student of chemistry, uh, 
what is the fastest time scale that is even relevant to us? To answer that question, let us have a look at this equation, which gives us a theoretical description of uh, your rate constant. KB, KB is a Boltzmann constant, T is absolute temperature, H is Planck's constant. These are the partition functions. EA, as we all know, is activation energy. So now, the PPT is not visible. Really? Okay. Yes. Give me a second. Well, my screen is shared. Can yeah, nobody? But, uh, 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 I'll just try to stop this and start sharing again. How about now? Has it come up? Now yes. Sir. Now yes. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepakta. Right. So this is the equation I was talking about, right? Adding equation. So now let us think. Fastest time scale. Time scale is reciprocal of time constant for a first order process, right? So uh, fastest time scale would be associated with the largest value of k. OK? That will give you the smallest time. So when is this k largest? First of all, what is the best case scenario of activation energy? At best, it can be zero. When activation energy is zero, this exponential term would become one. Okay. So let us say we are handling uh, something that does not require any activation. So exponential term becomes one. And those of us who have studied a little bit of statistical thermodynamics would be able to tell that this ratio involving uh, partition functions, here also the best case scenario is that this ratio can be equal to one. So we are left with KBT by H. This is the largest value of rate constant one could get. And this rate constant, when you take reciprocal of it, gives you uh, a time constant of, well, uh, the rate constant is 16 to 20 to the power 12 per second. Reciprocal of it, the time constant turns out to be 170 per second. Fem2 means 10 to the power minus 15. So what we learn from here is that the theoretical expectation, the expectation from theory is that the fastest chemical process can take place in time scale of about 170 femtosecond. We don't really need to go any faster. If you have the capability of measuring this kind of time constant, we are good. We can measure all the chemistry that we can determine all the chemistry that happens. Uh, there is another uh, little hand waving argument that, by which we can arrive at more or less similar number. But this is what gave rise to this field uh, that is called femtochemistry or ultra-fast dynamics in chemistry. Let me, before going into our work, show you some uh, very classical, important Nobel Prize winning result and potentially Nobel Prize winning results for the future uh, in this field. First of all, what you see here is the work of Professor Ahmed Zuel, one of the pieces of work that got him his Nobel Prize. So what he did is that, I'll not get into the detail of the experiment, uh, for that, uh, I had uh, taught a course on ultra-fast processes on NPTEL. Those lectures are available on uh, YouTube. Whoever is interested can search YouTube with my name and ultra-fast processes. You'll get the lectures. Okay. But what he did is he followed the photo dissociation of ICN. So basically breaking of the IC bond uh, using ultra-fast spectroscopy. He initiated a reaction using an ultra-fast intense laser pulse. And he followed how the uh, fragments are... Uh, forming as a function of time. And this, you can think, is a plot of buildup of population of the CN fragment with time. As you see, there is a rise. And this should remind us of what we studied in chemical kinetics. Remember how the population of uh, the intermediate varies for a reaction uh, where we go from a reactant to intermediate to product? If you remember, the population of intermediate grows for some time. And then eventually, of course, it has to decay. What we're showing you here is the initial growth period of the intermediate, which here is basically the CN fragment. And if you look at the x-axis, this uh, formation of CN fragment, that is photo dissociation, is complete within 600 times per second. And if you fit this to an exponential function, you get a time constant of 205 times per second. If you remember, 
the expectation from our theory is that this time constant for the fastest chemical process that is breaking of a bond is 170 femtosecond. Experimentally, we get 205 plus minus 30 femtosecond. Now you tell me, is that good? Or is that good? Well, no matter which choice you take, it is good. It cannot get any better given the kind of measurement we are doing. Not only that, uh, what Zewell's group could do successfully is that they could show how uh, the bond breaks as a result of, or so it's like this, you have a bond, right? It tries to break, but then it tries to deform as well. So there is some kind of an oscillation. And during this oscillation, the bond energy increases, increases, increases until the, the fragments don't come back anymore. So you could take what is called snapshots of bond breaking. Uh, this ICN uh, experiment that I discussed earlier uh, is discussed uh, in a very lucid manner in uh, Macquarie and Simon's textbook. Uh, these figures are actually from uh, Atkins Physical Chemistry book. So uh, in case you're an undergraduate student who would like to understand this a little better, I recommend that you read this book. It's uh, uh, described in, uh, by the masters in a way that I can never do. But I'd like to uh, conclude this uh, literature survey part of today's talk by presenting something that is very close to my heart and something that is more recent than uh, Zewell's work. Uh, this is the work of Eric Nibering and his group from uh, Bonn, Germany. Uh, and what he did is something that is very fundamental. As we have learned in chemistry from high school onwards, uh, acid-based reaction is very fast and Conventionally, we think that it is not possible to assign a mechanism to it. Well, not any longer. What Nevering's group has done is that using ultrafast dynamics, ultrafast spectroscopy, and using something called a photoacid for pyrenine. Well, I'll not uh, start talking about photoacids because then I'll get uh, carried away and we'll talk only about that, not about our work. But uh, suffice to say that photoacid is something in which the proton is released upon uh, shining light. That is what they did. And the only difference is that they shun uh, this molecule with uh, a pulse, an ultra short pulse of intense laser light. So they generated a burst of protons and got this uh, acid based reaction started. So that is your starting of a stopwatch by generating a burst of reactant. And then they followed how, using IR spectroscopy with femtosecond time resolution, how, uh, how much time it takes for the proton to go out uh, acetate is used as the base. How much time does it take for acid, acetic acid to form from acetate? And by doing that, they established this mechanism of acid-based reaction. So whatever we have studied for decades or centuries about acid-based reaction now is no longer uh, actually correct. Mechanism of acid-based reaction is established thanks to this very powerful ultrafast spectroscopic technique. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is fluorescence spectroscopy, which uh, I believe was definitely there in uh, third year BSc honors curriculum of uh, Calcutta University. Uh, I suspect it would be there in all curricula now because I mean, curricula are getting larger and more updated. So uh, perhaps this is not very new to you. Suffice to say that fluorescence means a radiative transition, a transition involving uh, a photon emission of light between electronic states of the same spin multiplicity. Uh, most of the time for organic molecules that we handle, the ground state is singlet. So uh, the uh, em emission involving the first excited singlet state and the seconds to nanoseconds, maybe hundreds of nanoseconds sometimes, uh, associated with these electronic states. Phosphorescence is a radiative transition involving electronic states of different spin multiplicity. Once again, I'll not get into that too much. Whoever is interested, once again, uh, my NPTEL course on molecular spectroscopy is there. Uh, videos are available on uh, YouTube. Uh, in case you want to actually credit that course, the course will be floated again next January. Uh, if you're interested, contact me and I'll tell you uh, how to register for it. So we do two kinds of experiments. One is the conventional steady state experiment, meaning that you record spectra, absorption spectra and fluorescence spectra. And when you do that kind of experiment, you want to know two things. First is, where does the uh, emission of light occur? Where means at which energy? Uh, the parameter of energy that we use most conventionally is wavelength. So it's basically reciprocal of energy, right? 
So where it occurs? Is this maximum of fluorescence spectrum at 500 nanometer or 600 nanometer or 250 nanometer? Very often, that gives us an idea about uh, properties like polarity, viscosity, uh, and such things in the immediate vicinity of the fluorophore. The fluorophores are myopic. They cannot see very far. They can only report properties of uh, their first solvation layer or so. OK, maybe second solvation layer. So this position of uh, the emission maximum often tells us about the uh, properties of microenvironment. The other thing that we want to know is that, does it fluoresce strongly or does it fluoresce feebly? And that is quantified by this thing called emission quantum yield, which is essentially a ratio of uh, the rates of fluorescence and absorption, or in other words, intensity of fluorescence, uh, fluorescent light uh, divided by intensity of absorbed light. And this correction factor is for change in absorbance. Let's not worry about that. The other kind of experiment that we have been doing for ever and has become uh, quite ubiquitous nowadays is time resolved experiments. So here, what we do is we excite using a pulse of light, like Zuel or neighboring data. What is the meaning of pulse of light? We use light of a wavelength that is absorbed by the molecule, but the light is on for a very, very small time, like this. So see, this is the plot of intensity of excitation light against time. Nothing here. Then it goes on for a short while, goes off, and then it remains off for a long time. So uh, a pulse is uh, what you see when you do flash photography, right? When you use a flash to do photography, the flashlight goes on for a small time. Or when you see lightning, right? In a, on a dark night, raining, uh, you cannot see anything. Suddenly, there is a lightning bolt. And for a brief instance, you see everything around it because that is uh, the duration for which lightning is on. So here we use a pulse like that from a laser, typically, to produce an excited state population. Meaning, see, when we talk about molecules in bulk, uh, we are dealing with Avogadro number of molecules, right? Uh, 10 to the power 23. And 10 to the power 23 is a number that is uh, perhaps uh, large beyond our comprehension. When we think of a large number, what do we say? We say lakh, we say crore. Uh, if you're a finance minister, you talk about lakhs of crores or crores of crores. Try and figure out how many crores of crores and crores 10 to the power 23 is. Then you'll realize how large this number we're talking about. So out of this large number, when we uh, excite using pulse light, we perhaps promote a few crores, a few lakhs of molecules uh, to their excited state. So that is called buildup of uh, excited state population, and that happens within the time for which the pulse is on, right? Oh, so on the, the I build up see your slide, actually. Once again. Something. There is some problem in your slide, actually. I cannot see. It is very small, no. actually, in the screen. Um, I mean, can you see the slide at all? I can see, but the size is very small. Am I... Oh, but I am uh, in full screen, actually. Um, sir? sir, actually, you can pin on the slide. Then you can see it's a full screen. Yes. So you have to pin me, Niluza. OK. So here it is OK to put a pin inside somebody. It's fine. OK. Now, so what we do is we create an excited state population all of a sudden by this ultra short burst of light. Then what happens? You have promoted molecules to excited state. Do they come back to the ground state the moment the light goes off? They don't. Right? Uh, I have a violent analogy for this. Think of a tight slap. The uh, contact time between the fingers and the cheek is very small, right? But then uh, when the fingers have left the cheek, the pain does not go, go away, provided the slap was tight enough. It takes some time for the pain to go away. It lingers for a while, and slowly it goes down, right? So here also, the excited state population depletes over some time. And since this excited state population is decaying on its own, in the simplest case scenario, this decay is of first order. We have all studied chemical kinetics. We are familiar with uh, first order processes, right? So first order. First order means exponential decay. And exponential decay means if I plot log of intensity of fluorescence, well, fluorescence intensity is directly proportional to excited state population. So a similar plot of that against time is going to look like a straight line. And this here is the familiar integrated rate law of a first order process. Only difference is instead of concentration, we are using intensity. 
instead of rate constant we are using reciprocal of time constant because that is more conventional this is called lifetime this this uh, uh, tau the time constant is called lifetime for a reason i recommend that you read the first chapter of lakovich if you want to learn more about fluorescence spectroscopy now the thing is this fluorescence lifetime is proportional to fluorescence quantum yield which is a measure of how strong the emission is so uh, unless there is some other complicating factor a longer lifetime would mean stronger emission that is what we look for and more often than not this decay is not single exponential there is deviation from single exponential behavior so you don't get a straight line in the semi log plot you get a curve and the most popular model not necessarily always the correct model is a uh, multi exponential pit all right we'll talk about that later when we show our data all right i uh, went a little slow with the introduction part because i understand that there are undergraduate students here uh, i hope that this has prepared the ground for them so that they can understand actual experimental results from our lab okay one more thing before i go into that when you study fluorescence spectroscopy you get to know something called kasha's rule which essentially tells you that fluorescence is expected to take place from the lowest vibrational level of the first excited singlet state and therefore uh, the fluorescence spectrum is expected to be a mirror image of the absorption spectrum well that is great very systematic uh, that's what you see for things like pyridine or naphthalene and so on and so forth but the problem is if it happened for all fluorophores in the world then uh, fluorescence spectroscopy would have been a very very boring field and god is kind and what happens is post excitation during the lifetime of the excited state many times molecules undergo processes which are called excited state processes and we might want to think of them as excited state reaction i mean they can give out a proton they can undergo an isomerization that they cannot undergo in the ground state and so on and so forth and if that happens then you expect to see a red shifted fluorescence spectrum you expect to see a rise time in the red end of the fluorescence spectrum which is associated with the newly formed state as a result of the excited state process and you can combine steady state and time resolved data to follow the time evolution of the fluorescence spectrum what you see here is actual data from our uh, lab from 16 17 years ago uh, here the high energy band over time so over 3.5 nanosecond makes way for a low energy band uh, which occurs at something like at 23000 centimeter inverse which is actually this band okay so this is what you expect to see if an excited state process takes place and the states involved are fluorescent all right uh, of course all this measurement is easier said than done to do it you need sophisticated instruments uh, this is time correlated single photon counting that you see this is a new machine but we have been using another instrument for a long time this allows us to measure lifetimes in nanosecond to hundreds of picosecond time scale femtosecond optical gating allows us to go down to hundreds of femtosecond there is one more technique that we use called pump probe that uh, we will not discuss today now using these techniques we have looked at a plethora of interesting systems uh, molecules with unusual photophysics uh, have uh, been our uh, obsession for the last 10 years we have looked at many such molecules Uh, over the last 6 7 years we have got into the field of exotic nanostructures which i thought i'll talk about today but then i backtracked um again for about 10 12 years now we have had this uh, dream of developing artificial photosynthesis system using di silica nanoconjugates and studying ultra fast dynamics in them we made some progress hit a roadblock but perhaps are now in a position uh, to restart this this uh, problem while doing that we got interested in plasmonics because we figured that plasmonics can actually help us in what is called light harvesting so in collaboration with professor alison funston's group of monash university australia we have uh, started studying um, ultra fast dynamics in gold nanoparticle assemblies what you see here is tm image of your uh, gold nanoparticle dimers that we have prepared we have a student together with alison uh, who's about to graduate now uh, so this is a new field for us and uh, we have tried to get into biophysical chemistry just a little bit in collaboration with professor samrat mukhopadhyay of aiza mohali and our very own professor kamand patap sharma now what i want to talk about today is a very small part of our uh, program but it has kept us fascinated over the last 8 years or so and this field is uh, of relevance to solid state organic photoemitters 
as we know organic electronics has arrived now things like uh, this flexible keyboard or flexible chip or even a tv screen that you can roll up and put in your bag is no longer uh, these are no longer parts of science fiction they are part of our everyday life things that we uh, don't even give a second thought for many of these applications what you need is you need organic material that could be fluorescent or emissive in solid state and there uh, conventional thinking hits a roadblock because conventional fluorophores are usually strongly fluorescent in solution the moment you make solids out of them something called aggregation caused quenching happens and that's a problem Mo the moment molecules get together and i'm going to talk about this when we talk about our new result our results also when molecules get too close to each other they start talking to each other and they quench each other's fluorescence this is uh, aggregation caused quenching so one needs to work with fluorogenic molecules molecules that are not fluorescent in uh, solution because of flexible structure flexible structure brings in a lot of non radiative pathways by which the excited state can relax a lot of uh, non of excited state processes can happen for these molecules if you make a solid or aggregate then there is some hope that they'll no longer remain so flexible and perhaps they'll become fluorescent now um, acq is always a problem here so whether you will get emission or not at the end is determined by an interplay of aie aggregation induced enhancement of emission and acq okay um, aie is a fashionable term now a lot of people work in this field and as i said you achieve aie try to achieve aie by uh, stopping the movement of molecular segments and many of many applications of such photoemissive aggregates have been proposed in the last decade or so more recently uh, this uh, lizard mentioned that we are getting into imaging we are getting into imaging for this very reason that aie more recently has been shown to have prospect in biomedicine specifically in bioimaging so our foray into this field was using a ship base uh, thanks to this uh, really good uh, phd student i had tohin khan tohin has now done with his first doctorate in europe and is now looking for a second one and this has been carried forward by shorodip who's another uh, brilliant phd student who's working on this now now uh, this field was actually started in our lab by tohin so he wanted to work with this molecule called cellophane very very common molecule used frequently in inorganic chemistry because it's a good chelating agent and a lot of people have actually worked on its fluorescence spectroscopy uh, unfortunately half of those results as we found out uh, were actually incorrect because they did not uh, adopt some very basic uh, precautions that you won't need to adopt when you do fluorescence spectroscopy since we said this in our first paper we earned a lot of enemies worldwide i'll not go into that uh, now if anybody is interested i can discuss later but the reason why we wanted to work with this is uh, first of all uh it's easy to synthesize see we are chemists but uh, we are not synthetic chemists we uh, are not good at synthesis but this synthesis is such that even we can do it without much hassle as it turned out purification is not as trivial as synthesis so the idea is this this molecule is very flexible so if we make a metal complex out of it can we bring in fluorescence can we have a uh, coordination induced or complexation induced fluorescence or if we make solid out of it or aggregate out of it do we get fluorescence can we get this uh, aie that we talked about a little while ago first experiment we tried was complexation we tried uh, i think 29 or 30 different cations and we found that you get uh, increase uh, well you get enhancement in emission only with two zinc and aluminum and the reason why complexation would lead to photoemission of course is rigidification interestingly Uh, the effect of zinc and aluminum are not the same. What I show you here is plot of fluorescence quantum meal. Remember, quantum meal means how strong the emission is, and uh, also please note that quantum meal here is plotted in a logarithmic scale. So the increase is actually much more than what you might think if this was in linear scale. So this here is the. Uh, oh, where's my pointer? This is the uh, fluorescence quantum meal of bare uh, well. free base cellophane upon complexion complexation with zinc it becomes uh, more than 10 times stronger fluorescent upon complexation with aluminum it becomes a thousand times stronger 
fluorescent. And this is manifested very nicely in our time resolved data. Remember what we said a little while ago, uh, lifetime, in the simplest case scenario, is directly proportional to fluorescence quantum yield. So we see that fluorescence of cellophane dies off within, say, 60 picosecond. Very small lifetime, very feeble fluorescence. Makes sense. Upon complexation with zinc, uh, it dies off a little uh, later. So lifetime increases from, say, uh, 5, 10 uh, picosecond to maybe 30, 40 picosecond. Upon complexation with aluminum, you can see that this decay has become really, really long. In fact, now the lifetime is in nanosecond. That is why we have orders of magnitude increase in fluorescence quantum heat. and makes sense. So we propose are, that are if you want one, to send... Are in, are in the... Yes. Yeah. PPTs, PPTs are not visible. Um, uh, have you pinned me? Uh, uh, please no, uh, yeah. move your cursor on uh, my window and there is a pin. If you click that, uh, I think it will become visible. Okay, thank you. Oh. All right. So uh, with zinc, we still have a tens of picosecond lifetime, but well, longer than what it is for the uh, free base cellophane. With aluminum, we have nanosecond lifetime. Why is that so? Uh, the first explanation we thought of is that zinc is a heavier ion than aluminum. And it is well known in the community of photochemists that if you have a heavy atom, then you have a more effective what is called intersystem crossing. So your molecule would go from singlet to triplet state and fluorescence would get quenched. But then we thought that maybe that's not the only reason. Uh, what came to our mind is that can there be some structural effect as well? Because we had this uh, ACQ versus AIE thing in mind. And we knew from literature that for these kind of uh, complexes, there is often a monomer dimer equilibrium. And it's also known that for molecules like cellophane, the zinc complex is expected to be dimeric. So see, if it's dimeric, then two cellophane molecules come close to each other and they would be most likely pi stacked. So they can talk to each other. Aluminum complex is expected to be uh, monomeric. Now, uh, so that could bring in an additional factor. So we ask the question, uh, do structural uh, factors have any role to play or not? The only way to answer that would be to make crystals out of them and uh, do extra crystallography. And we did that. We are successful to get the extra structure of the aluminum complex, and it turned out to be monomeric. Unfortunately, uh, even after eight years, the crystals of uh, zinc complex remain elusive, not only for us, but also for uh, professional crystallographers. However, we do have mass spectroscopic data that indicates that the zinc complex is indeed dimeric. So knowing that, we propose, we hypothesize that uh, perhaps structural effect has a role to play. In zinc complex, since the molecules come close together, they quench each other as well. At this point, this is only a hypothesis, but we'll come back and we'll show you some evidence to support this shortly. Let's take a rain check on that uh, for a little while. Now let us move on to the second part of the problem, but this will lead back to the first one as well. See, uh, the whole reason of doing these experiments is that you want something that emits in solid state, right? So we wanted to see whether that really happens. And so we put these molecules and complexes in several solid matrices like polymers. Um, we made crystal wherever possible. We made drop cast film and so on and so forth. I want to focus on two cases. Uh, for free base cellophane and for the aluminum complex, I want to discuss the data in solution and in crystalline form. You might remember that for free base cellophane, uh, the solution uh, in solution phase, the lifetime is a picosecond. Here we are doing a nanosecond experiment, so you don't even see the decay. It's ultra fast in this time regime. So this is how the decay looks in solution, picosecond lifetime in solution. In crystalline form, we have a nanosecond decay. See, the decay gets over only after 18 nanoseconds, well, 18 minus 6, 12 nanoseconds or so. So uh, this part is actually achieved for free base cellophane. But then we also wanted to work with the aluminum complex because aluminum complexes are much more stable. With aluminum complex, what we see is, you might remember that they had uh, nanosecond lifetime in, crystal, in solution phase. Upon making crystals, the aluminum complex has a picosecond lifetime. So uh, twist is an understatement. There is a complete reversal in trends. The first thing is that 
uh, you cannot really make a, a good display or something using the aluminum complex. But now the question is why? Why is it that the free base cellophane that has picosecond lifetime in solution become uh, longer lived, except have a longer lived excited state in crystal? Well, we can sort of understand that. Why is it that the aluminum complex, which has a longer lived excited state already in solution, has such a small lifetime when you make crystal out of it? The answer comes from extra crystal uh, structure once again. At this time, we zoom out a little bit and we see that in free base cellophane, First of all, the molecules are like this. The two rings are uh, sort of perpendicular to each other. Moreover, uh, for adjacent molecules, the nearest neighbor rings are sort of perpendicular to each other. No pi stack. So all that happens in uh, crystals of cellophane is that all this uh, jiggling and wiggling of uh, the molecular segments, they are quenched. But no additional interaction comes in to bring in a CQ. That's why we get an increase in lifetime. For aluminum complex, first thing that happens is that the complex is planar. It's planarized due to complexation. That's why it is uh, highly uh, fluorescent in solution state. But then when they pack, these planarized complexes pack in a manner where they're parallel to each other and close enough to have pi pi interaction. And that can bring in a newer, new excited state phenomena like exiplex formation eczema formation, right? So uh, it appears that structural uh, aspects have a very important role to play. And now if you go back to the zinc complex, zinc, zinc complex, these uh, cellophane moieties are stacked already, right? Even in one complex, even in solution. So we think that this result in the crystal phase of aluminum complex gives us uh, a circumstantial evidence supporting the hypothesis that we have proposed for our zinc complex data. Okay. Now, now I'll go a little fast because I'm, my time has actually run out, I think. Um, so we put in uh, this ethoxy-methoxy group uh, with two, uh, for two uh, different purposes. First of all, we wanted to see that if you put in this ethoxy-methoxy group, uh, does the rotation of these uh, groups become the main non-radiative pathway? Well, it does, because now when we make complexes, we don't get any enhancement in fluorescence in solution. But the other thing that happens is, if you look at the crystal structure, just insertion of these small uh, ethoxy and methoxy groups disrupts this nice planar structure that we had earlier. And now we have puckered structure. And uh, remember, nice structure is not good to get nice fluorescence. We want the structure uh, to be not planar if uh, we are to get fluorescence. And that is achieved by introducing this small substitution. It really makes a big difference by disrupting the planar uh, structure and making these complexes uh, strongly fluorescent with nanosecond lifetime in uh, crystal phase, not in solution phase. So what was the fluorophore now becomes the fluorogen. Last part of the story, uh, Shorodip Swarp, is all right, uh, we have reached somewhere using uh, zinc complexes. Can we get uh, strongly emissive zinc? Uh, well, we have reached somewhere using aluminum complexes. Can we get strongly emissive nanosecond lifetime uh, zinc complexes as well? Through that, what we thought is uh, it's actually difficult to make monomeric zinc complexes. It would usually be dimeric for this kind of ligands. But then, can we have a complex that is not stacked like this? but perhaps um, bridge like this. And there was difference in report of this molecule, which, well, Shorodip likes to call Salampi. Uh, see, all these uh, fancy names are given by my students. I just uh, obey the detect. So it was known that if you use acetate as an ion, then uh, you get a, this kind of a bridged dimer. So even though it's a dimer, there is no pi stacking. And we got the same kind of crystal structure in our lab as well. Here we see that we have a zinc complex with a nanosecond lifetime. If we compare with the case of cellophane, the zinc complex still had tens of picosecond lifetime. So just look at uh, free base uh, cellophane data and uh, zinc cellophane data. They're different, but not as different as that of the aluminum complex. Here, both zinc and aluminum complexes of Salampi have nanosecond lifetimes. So two things before we conclude this part of the story. 
first of all, what we are saying essentially is that you have to avoid pie stacking uh, to uh, obtain strong fluorescence. But let me put this on record that this may not be uh, one ring to rule them all because there are reports. So what you see here is a paper, a uh, well, three-year-old paper by Gershon and co-workers where they have prepared uh, pie stacked organic solids that are strongly fluorescent. You can see the crystal fluorescing with your bare eyes. Okay, so what we see holds for the uh, class of molecules we are working with may not be or is not the universal truth. That's point number one. Point number two is now if you go back and think of this uh, ISC business that we touched upon at the very beginning. So far, uh, the picture that we have presented might have given you the impression that it is structure all the way. It is not. Because even here, where we can manipulate the structure in such a way to get a nanosecond lifetime for this ink complex, it is still uh, associated with a sh little shorter lifetime compared to the aluminum complex. So electronic factors do have a role to play. Well, uh, this is the last part of the story. Um, well, this is about making more enemies, so let me not, let me not talk about it now. Uh, I'll skip this, and I'll go straight to the conclusion. What we have said here today is that uh, using these shift bases, one can bring about strong fluorescence by complexation as well as identification. For the class of molecules we have studied, you want to avoid pi stacking if you want a strongly fluorescent uh, solid system. All right. We have worked with another class of molecules as well. This is called DBMPT, and this is uh, this was started by uh, my former student, uh, my former postdoc, Anushua, and it's been carried forward by, well, now almost former postdoc, uh, uh, Shomodipto. This is in collaboration with our colleague, uh, Professor Anil Kumar. I'll not talk about this today, but uh, on 29th, uh, day after tomorrow, I have a talk under the ages of Indian Chemical Society, well, virtually in Science College, Kolkata. Uh, there, uh, this is the part of the story that I'm going to tell. Whoever is interested, uh, please feel free to join. And there, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the results that we've got using this new toy that got installed last year. This allows us to look at fluorescence lifetimes under a microscope. So you can really look at uh, not only ultra fast, but also ultra small. And using that, we have got some very interesting results. Uh, that is what we're going to talk about in that talk, but well, not today. Uh, one more announcement. I talked about NPTEL. NPTEL is a platform that uh, where many of us teach courses and anybody uh, in the world can uh, will learn from here. Uh, so this course on quantum chemistry that I'm teaching will start uh, in a couple of weeks or so. Already, actually, this number is dated. Now we have more than 1,400 learners. This is uh, basically it's in first year MSc level. Whoever is interested, uh, you're more than welcome to study this. With that, let me come to an end of what I wanted to say today with uh, uh, by placing gratitude where it belongs. Let me thank all my students, past and present, postdocs, collaborators who have enriched us with their expertise, funding agencies, and thank you all uh, for being here early in the morning and for bearing with me even as I overshot a little bit. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Anindu, for your nice talk. Any questions from students? One or two? Any questions or queries? Sir, I have one question, sir. Please. Sir, sir actually, um, in my PhD work, I find uh, an uh, aggregation induced emission compound, which is an aphthalamide derivative, uh, in what uh, published there. So actually, I want to check whether it is uh, this aggregation induced emission um, uh, compound uh, is capable to show the LED um, uh, LED capability. Uh, so mm -hmm. how uh, I can check that? Uh, so you is... want to study electroluminescence in that case. Uh, what you need to do is you need, want to deposit your molecule, and there are several ways of doing it uh, on a uh, uh, transparent electrode. Typically, uh, you would use ITO, Indian pin oxide, or FTO, 
uh, and then you want to make a device out of it. So basically, that transparent electrode is there. That is what allows light to come in. You have a layer of your molecule on it, and then uh, usually use a counter electrode uh, of some metal. So that is your device, right? Now you put this in. First thing to do is put this inside a uh, fluorimeter, turn off the lamp, and connect your device to a voltage source. So apply voltage and see if light comes out. If it does, okay. then you can uh, look at other parameters and establish how good it is for applications in LED. In fact, that is what we intend to do with all our molecules after this. Okay, sir. Any special uh, instrument needed sir, for this experiment? Uh, to start with, no. If you have a photometer and if you can okay. deposit, uh, well, you can deposit using uh, several methods, as I said. So if you want to do an accurate uh, coating, then you might want to use such a facility that is there. So nanofabrication facilities, there are several in the country now. You can go and use their uh, well, layer by layer coating facilities and all that they have. To start with, I think uh, spin coating, drop coating uh, is good enough. And <laughs> as my colleague, Professor Arindam Chaudhary has established, if you want to do spin coating without uh, like 500% accuracy, it is enough to buy a mixie and that's what he has done for a long time. He bought a mixer, mixer grinder, right? And he yes. uh, put uh, using fe uh, quick or something, he put in a flat plate on top of the rotor. Okay. And uh, then he used to put uh, drops of uh, his sample on top of it. He would get a good enough uh, uh, film. But uh, if you want to use a proper spin coater, of course, you should do that. OK, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, there are two questions in the chat box. Yes. Uh, first one is magnitude of activation energy of dissociation in a photo acid really very small. Uh, typically of, uh, say, hydrogen bonding energy or something. Something that you can overcome using uh, excitation used in UV or visible planes. Then Amit has asked, which factor is more important for a complex to become uh, fluorescence active? Multidented ligands or pi pi stacking? Uh, so, so what we believe is both. Uh, if it is a multidented ligand, then the good thing is that without intermediation of too many other uh, anions and all, uh, using one uh, ionic center, perhaps, uh, you can immobilize the molecule. So that is good. And if you end up getting pi pi stacking for the molecules that we have studied, it is bad because now these molecules start talking to each other and quench each other's fluorescence. So an interplay of both is what I would say. Uh, another question, uh, Dr. Torun Mistri. Uh, fluorescence lifetime and rise time are the same? Um, uh, see, uh, let us talk about time constants. I think that is better. Uh, lifetime is conventionally associated with the decay time. But then, if you have uh, a, an excited state that grows with time, and then of course it has to decay, this is conveniently fitted by a bi exponential model, one of which would have a negative amplitude. That is called the rise state. Any more questions? No, no. OK, so let's thank uh, Professor Anindo Dotto for his nice and illuminating talk. Okay, and you can access him for any questions later on in his mail. Okay. Thank you, Anindo. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, so uh, uh, we are switch, switching to the next uh, talk actually um, by uh, Dr. Asit Patro. Uh, he's a senior scientist from CSA National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi. He's uh, also an alumni from uh, our department actually from IIT Kharagpur. Uh, Asit uh, did his BSc from 1997 in uh, from an MSc in 1998 from Vidyasagar University. Uh, then he joined in uh, Professor Deepak Ranjan Small uh, Lab in the Chemistry Department at IIT Kharagpur. And after completing his PhD, he uh, in nine, uh, 2006 actually he joined Professor. Michael Bendikov's group as a postdoctoral researcher and the Weizmann Institute of Science Israel. Uh, after that, in 2009, he moved to uh, 
University of California, uh, uh, USA, working with Professor G.C. Bajan. And after, uh, uh, as a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at University of Cambridge with Professor uh, J.R. Niske, he joined as a senior scientist in the CSI National Physical Laboratory, uh, New Delhi, since October 2012. Uh, at present, he is the principal scientist and <coughs> his present research interested uh, basically on pi conjugated systems for application in organic electronics, namely organic and perovskite solar cells. Uh, he has published more than 50 papers and book chapters and also has uh, <coughs> patent. Uh, he has also transferred some technology. Uh, so with all this, I welcome uh, Dr. Asit Patro to uh, give his presentation. Asit, please. <coughs> Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, sir. So thank you for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, it is also great pleasure that my sir and uh, Elmoni Sarkaj introduce myself. I also see my uh, my uh, my PhD guide, Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal. Thank and you, sir. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, because you, I am here. And uh, can you audible and uh, you can see my presentation. Anyone tell me? Hello? Uh, yes, it, it is clear actually, I think. It's clear and uh, presentation audio, uh, audio sound is clear? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes Go ahead, Ashit. Yes, clear. Okay, so now I start. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay, so today I'm going to present the semiconducting conjugated material for organic solar cell from synthesis to device. So the second slide, before start to my business, I would like to present where I come and what is the mission and vision of our institute, means CSR National Physical Laboratory. So CSR National Physical Laboratory is a unique type of research institute because this is the NMI of India. NMI is a, something different because every country has one NMI. What is the role of NMI? NMI role is to maintain the standard and quality of the country. Means if you see, in, if you look in the school level book, there is seven SI unit like kilogram, meter, uh, time, ampere, Kelvin, mole, and they are derived from like uh, speed of light, Planck constant. So we are maintaining the primary standard of the seven SI unit. And <coughs> suppose in the market you buy one kilo something or maybe one meter lead. So this one kilo, one meter is somehow traceable to NPL. It's not we are give the directly to the vendor means there is some step, it may be measuring instrument and working, primary, secondary. So every equipment is traceable to N uh, NPL. So what is our mandate? The National Measurement Institute is the act of parliament. We have a mandate in, to maintain the national standard and responsibility of realization, establishment, upgradation, maintenance, and dissemination of the measurement of the country that's need to the country. Okay, now <clears throat> back to my presentation. So first, uh, <laughs> I will start the solar cell development. So, solar cell development like this, the first generation solar cell like uh, single crystal silicon vapor, then second generation amorphous silicon, uh, polycrystalline silicon, cadmium telluride silicon, copper tellurium, then third generation organic solar cell, dye sensitive solar cell, then fourth generation, and <coughs> finally the emerging area is uh, perovskite solar cell. So, now the first generation solar cell, 90% is market is led by the first generation solar cell, single crystal silicon solar cell. But if you go top to bottom, the efficiency decreases. But still people are increased third, fourth and fifth generation solar cell because the cost effective and flexibility. And why the organic solar cell? Because organic solar cell have few advantages like flexibility, large area deposition, color, semi-transparency, performance in low and diffusion light, lightweight printing and low cost, and easy fabrication process compared to inorganic uh, solar cell. And also organic material have few disadvantages like low efficiency, low stability, and low strength. Now, the type of organic photovoltaic device. There is a four different kind of organic solar cell is available. One is single layer. This is the first people are uh, discovered single layer, where the organic material is sandwiched between the electrode, uh, cathode and anode. And cathode and anode 
and this cell is not working very well because the exciton binding is too much where it is difficult to separate hole and electron second is bilayer where just we generate the p and n type material and where hole and electron can be moved separately and go to the transfer electrode and then bulk heterojunction where the everywhere is the bulk so this is the most useful bulk heterojunction and finally tandem solar cell what is the use of tandem solar cell because solar energy sunlight have some energy but the polymer have some defined band gap if the band gap is more than the sunlight then this energy also useful otherwise this energy is not useful that's why we are using tandem solar cell so this is the mechanism of organic solar cell so what happened the first light fall in the organic solar organic material and exciton is generated means hole and electron is created now hole and electron when it come to the uh, pn junction hole and electron are separated hole move to the um, uh, anode and uh, electron move to the cathode and electron and hole are separated and finally photocurrent is generated now the current is generated so this is the mechanism but since we are a chemist we need little bit idea about the device but we are much more interested about the chemistry because in organic solar cell we are mainly using the conducting material mainly conjugated material so what is the conjugated material it is nothing in the material having a single and double bond <coughs> alternate single and double bond character so conjugated polymer have a wide range of conductivity from insulator to metal depends upon its nature and the doping level so depends upon its nature and doping level conjugated polymer have a wide range of conductivity like insulator to semiconductor to metal so band gap is very important because finally the light fall into the material homo electron jump to the lomo so band gap is very important so as a chemist the tuning of band gap is very important how you tuning the band gap because there is a lot of technique how you could tuning the band gap like <coughs> increase the conjugation length if you increase the length of the polymer uh, conjugation of the polymer the band gap is decreased but not a critical you cannot go beyond uh, close to zero where after certain length if you increase the chain length it is not decreased at all so conjugation incorporating of electron donating and electron withdrawing group alternative donor acceptor concept and uh, there is a hybridization and intermolecular interaction and aromatic equilibrium so there is a several technique how you can control the band gap and also the energy level of the polymer uh, of the homo and lomo so this is one of the technique how you can control the band gap of a conjugated material suppose you have a insulator it's a wide band gap this is the gap between homo and lomo lomo is too high you cannot excite the homo homo electron to the lomo hair but if you go for semiconductor you need very small amount of energy to excite the homo electron uh, to homo electron to the lomo but if you go to the metal there is actually no band gap there is a pi pi orbital so electronic property of a material is very important for the electronic application just same concept you can apply for the organic material like ethylene if you go for ethylene there is a very high band gap if you go for more conjugated system like butadiene the band gap is decreases if you go for more conjugated system like octadiene band gap is again increases if you go for polymer then the <coughs> you see two band one is homo band one is conduction bands one is valency band so in polymer there is not a single molecule like a small molecule there is a single molecule but polymer there is not a single molecule it's a mixture of different kind of uh, uh, polymer means short chain long chain and high chain so that's why it's a band it's called band it's a conduction bands and uh, and uh, valency band so if you go for polymer the band gap is narrow now you need very small amount of energy to excite the homo electron to the lomo so this is the one of the concept how can you control how can you decrease how you can do tuning the homo lomo and band gap of a organic material hello can you one can tell me are you audible and it's okay hello yes sir no problem okay so now now we come to the organic solar cell so this is how we can fabricate the organic solar cell so this is a device structure of organic solar cell there is a few layers so just first you see glass substrate then ito then hole transport layer active layer electron transport layer and finally and finally there is a uh, metal aluminum sometimes you can uh, deposit silver gold 
copper depends upon the what function of the metal so glass which glass there is no scientific uh, scientific role in the device this is just for support because most of the layer are nanometer thickness so we need some support if you go for flexible device then you can go for flexible substrate like plastic then ito so ito and glass generally we are purchased from the market or ito or glass uh, uh, flexible substrate we just buy from the market then different kind of hole transport layer is available p dot ps small molecule and we just deposit by pin casting just there is a different technique just pin cast this is one of the easy technique we just make a layer of uh, 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 make a solution of the hole transport layer then make a layer of uh, 40 nanometer um, uh, then we use active layer this is we use the donor and acceptor molecule and the thickness of the uh, layer is 80 nanometer then electron transport layer and finally go for thermal deposition of the aluminum so this is a device structure and we are a chemist so now we are mainly synthesized whole transport material this is the whole transport material and the active layer so we are working at these two kind of material whole transport layer and active layer we are synthesized those material indigenously and followed by device fabrication for organic solar cell but if you but if you look into literature how you improve the power conversion efficiency of organic solar cell there is a few techniques one is device people they are mainly working on the device geometry single layer organic solar cell bilayer organic solar cell bar cattle junction and conventional this is one of the technique how you improve the power conversion efficiency of the organic solar cell so by <coughs> device optimization device architecture this is one of the technique this mainly the device people the physicists they can do this but as a chemist we are interested in the molecules because some, some uh, cell it have a power conversion efficiency is five by device geometry you can improve six seven maybe you can go up to eight by special design but beyond eight you cannot go by just uh, optimization device structure if you go if you want to go beyond eight then you have to introduce a new material so that's why you have to new, require a new material and good material, good polymer for the organic solar cell. So what kind of property you require for the organic solar cell? First, you need the homo lobo and band gap. So this is very important for my material, organic material, for any organic electronic application. What is the homo level? What is the band gap? And what is the homo level? Suppose sometimes homo level is good, 1.5 electron volt, but the homo level is maybe minus uh, 5 electron volt. This is not so good. So band gap homo lomo this is very you need uh, proper way then high hole mobility because in the organic solar cell exciton is dissociate hole remain in the polymer electron remain in the uh, uh, electron transport layer so hole should be moved very fast chemically and thermal stability because if your polymer is not so stable <coughs> then your device is not so stable so your material organic material should be some stability you need some stability by thermally and chemically compatibility except because you are not using organic material you are also using some other material you have to check the compatibility with other material also so this is also important and you cannot put the solid material in the you know, device so your polymer should be good soluble in any solvent some solvent and it gives a very good flame so these are the intensing nature of the polymer because these are the intensing nature because you cannot change the property of this polymer. Suppose some polymer called poly 3 hexyl thiopene, its band gap is 2 electron volt. It is always 2 electron volt. You cannot change. If you want to change, then you have to change the structure. So this 1 to 5 is the intensing nature of a, a material. But 6, 7, 8, 9, molecular weight, polydispersity, chemical defect, and purity. This are the you can change during polymerization. When you run the polymerization, you can control this six, seven, eight, nine. This technique. So one to five. If you want to change, then you have to change the molecule. If you want to control the molecular weight, polydispersity, chemical defect, and purity, then you have to go for good polymerization technique. So this is the two way by chemical modification and using good polymerization technique, you are able to produce a good quality of polymer. So now if you look into literature, these are some chemical structure of the polymer, uh, like polythyrexyl thiopene, uh, polythyrexyl thiopene, uh, fluorine base, carbazole base, 
polycyclopenta diethylpine base, silol base, like this type of molecule. These are commercially available, and most of the company are foreign company. They are selling this material to India, uh, and most of the people, those who are not uh, idea of chemists, they are buy this material from the outside and make their device. But you look into the uh, chemical structure of this uh, molecule, and you look, uh, you can found, found that they are either synthesized by Stille and Suzuki company, except the first one. They are using Gigna metathesis. This most of the compound they are synthesized either Stille and Suzuki company. It is also reported in literature that if the molecule have thiopine core, thiopine, then Suzuki is better. Uh, thiopine, then Stille is better. If there is a uh, phenyl ring like benzene ring, then Suzuki is better. So this is the cartoon in the end of the slide that how you can uh, make by phenylethane and boronic ester followed by dibomo and presence of petroleum, palladium catalyst, we can synthesize the polymer. So this is the cartoon. So first in our laboratory, we have synthesized poly-3-hexyl thiopine. This is the chemical structure of poly-3-hexyl thiopine. This is one of the most successful huge conducting polymer in the literature. And also there is a lot of commercial application of this molecule. So we have synthesized this molecule in, uh, in our lab uh, by 25 dibomo 3 hexyl thiopine by using Gigna metathesis reaction. And we got very good quality of polymer. This is totally indigenous synthesis in our laboratory. And after synthesize, we have checked the NMR and GPC. Just I showed the NMR, you can see this is a regioregular because there is some special uh, peak of the proton in the aliphatic proton. And you can see this is a regioregular or not. And we found that this is highly regioregular polymer of the poly 3 hexyl thiopine. And finally, we make a device using the device structure glass, ITO, then whole transport layer. Then we put our uh, material, what we synthesize, then finally the metal. And we got very good power conversion efficiency and our result is comparable to the commercially available material. So this is the indigenous development of uh, material in our laboratory in, in, for and followed by device fabrication. And we got very good result for the power conversion efficiency. So this is our first try to make something to check the what kind of polymer we synthesize in the lab is really good uh, for device fabrication. But synthesis is something different. You synthesize, you did a lot of characterization, GPC, NMR, uh, DSCTJ, and this is okay. But when you go for device fabrication, you can found you can found that this polymer is really good or not because there is a lot of uh, lot of uh, defect in the polymer. You can found like chemical defect, unnecessary coupling, uh, like this impurity, which are already effect which have already some uh, in, importance for the device fabrication process. So after successful synthesize this molecule, we have synthesized different kind of molecule like carbazole base. This is we synthesize by Suzuki coupling. By Suzuki coupling, just there is the two molecule and the presence of palladium catalyst. So we got the uh, polymer. I am not going to the synthesis of the precursor. This is a Already, already known molecules, but still we have to synthesize few steps and we synthesize this molecule PCDTBT and we synthesize not a milligram scale, we synthesize one gram and two gram scale and then we make a device fabrication and in this case we get much more power conversion efficiency. I am not going to details about the uh, device fabrication part. It's glass, ITO, then you deposit the whole transport layer, then you, you put your material, then finally go for thermal deposition under vacuum and you make your device. So, and we got around 6% efficiency using this material. So, after synthesize two, three molecules, then we study what is the effect of the heteroatom band, band gap and this type of things. Then we modify some structure, we use uh, furan, thiopine, celeropan, and to tuning the band gap. And again, we have synthesized P3, A and C, these three kind of polymer. And finally, we have uh, found, we have fabricated the device. And now we present a very good correlation between the uh, power conversion efficiency and the chemical structure of the polymer. So this is <coughs> this is how we have already synthesized four, five uh, molecule, uh, four, five polymer in our lab and followed by device fabrication, organic solar cell, and we got very power conversion efficiency. But what is the issue? Suppose we have synthesized the polymer five times. One and two times it is give very poor car, poor car, poor car power conversion efficiency. Means 
one and two times this uh, polymer is not so good three and four times maybe it's very good so it's what is the issue this batch to batch variation of the polymeric photovoltaic material it is happen because we have checked the gpc sometime it will give very high uh, chain length means uh, high molecular weight and sometime it will give very low poly molecular weight so this is happen is the batch to batch variation of the polymeric photovoltaic material is happen for us also so what is the issue for this case because when you go for steel coupling and suzuki coupling actually you just mix two material one is dietanilated and one is dibomo and presence of some solvent if you go for steel a toluene benzene or maybe chlorobenzene and then heat it there is no how there is no way how to control the molecular weight and polydispersity after end of the reaction you can check what is the molecular weight and polydispersity also when you run the reaction you exactly need one is to one equivalent of two molecules means 100 versus 100 if it's not 100 versus 100 like suppose if you take excess dietanilated this molecule then polymerization stop in this stage before forming the long chain if you excess dibomo suppose during oiling there is some mistake or maybe due to some impurity if you take excess this then polymerization is stop in this stage so you are not getting very high quality or very high molecular weight polymer uh, in this case sometimes you got it sometimes not so to overcome this problem what we did just is combine these two molecule to make a one molecule just you see bottom of the slide um, there is two molecule just you make a, a by this is called ab type of monomer so we have synthesized ab type monomer another molecule we put hexyl chain ethyl hexyl chain it's branch chain because this is also very important because finally we will go for solution process deposition means you have to make a soluble some solvent your polymer then you make a film means you make a polymer film so solubility is very important it is also well reported that when you go for branch alkyl chain like ethyl hexyl the solubility is improve improve and morphology also very good for the device fabrication so in this direction we have synthesized this molecule by multi step synthesis this is first molecule one uh, cyclopenta dithiophene followed by dialkylation then mono tenylation then selective uh, 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 steel coupling using excess this we got this compound compound 5 then again ldr reaction we got the compound 7 and similarly we got the compound 8 also compound 8 Similarly, we got the compound. So now we have this uh, two compound. Uh, just see the NMR. It's a very good uh, uh, NMR. You can see the NMR. We have characterized by NMR. And finally, we have made the polymerization by steel coupling. So when we go for steel coupling by two molecule, it will give the molecular weight 34 k. When go for Suzuki coupling, it will give 15 k. But when we are using AB type monomer. just end of the slide uh, and it will give 72k of course the polydispersity is little bit higher in this case so it gives very high molecular weight polymer when we use ab type of monomer compared to use two molecules so finally we have uh, make a device using our polymer and this is we got the power conversion efficiency around uh, 4% so this is one of our uh, good result that uh, we have synthesized our own molecule and followed by using our own molecule we have make a, a device a organic solar cell hello sir can you audible it's okay yes yes okay 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 so what i tell i have i what i tell this is i am telling about the donor material because polymer because in the organic solar cell there are two three layers like whole transport layer Uh, active layer and electron transport layer what i talk about we have synthesized the active layers because where the sunlight is absorbed now i am talking about the whole transport layer we also working in the whole transport layer because whole transport layer has a huge impact for the device stability because now in the market 90% market is covered by the silicon solar cell because their stability organic solar cell don't have too much stability that's why it's not able to enter in the market efficiency is good cheap everything is thing but the stability is the main issue but if you go for international status of organic solar cell 
if you go for conventional structure 10 to 12 percent inverted structure 11 to 13 percent tandem structure 13 to 17 percent if you go for perovskite 21 percent uh, 22.1 percent and for small area 19.7 for large area national tetas this is indian tetas i am not going to detail so in this case but all these are in large small scale because small scale is good for the lab scale uh, production but when you go for commercial application you have to need roll to roll deposition large area at, at least uh, six inch by six inch or maybe one foot by one foot then you can go for uh, parallel and uh, parallel and uh, cross uh, parallel correction and parallel and series correction to improve the, improve the voc uh, improve the voltage and current so you have to first you have to make the uh, device and then you go for a parallel and series connection to improve the voltage and current but all this device in the small area so now we have to go for large area device so in this case what we did if you look into literature the p dot pss this is one of the organic molecule and this is the structure of p dot pss this is of the one of the most successful used whole transport layer in organic solution but what is the culprit this molecule is a culprit because it have a pss pss what is the problem pss is acidic in nature hygroscopic in nature and protonation in nature because you make the device but during time, maybe after one week, maybe after one month, it due to acidic and protonation nature, the device is degraded, stability is down due to this part, PSS part. But PSS part is required. Well, without PSS, you cannot make it soluble P dot because P dot don't have any side chain. It is insoluble. So PSS, you need make it soluble, water soluble, and make it transparent. But when you add PSS, because it decrease the stability of the material there is an alternative lot of material is alternative is available but still alternative material is not so good in terms of power conversion efficiency in terms of stability is good but power conversion efficiency is not good so still we need some alternative of p dot pss so what we did so just you look in the device structure glass ito then whole transport layer so you cannot put p dot in the device because p dot is insoluble so either you have to make the soluble in some solvent then put in the device structure making the film or you have to think some polymerization technique and during polymerization it make a flip you, do, you don't need to make a, a another step for the film formation just you have to design a some polymerization technique during polymerization it it, it will make a polymer and instantly it will deposit on the ITO. So what we did, electrochemical polymerization. This is one of the innovation in, uh, in our side that we make a flame on ITO by electrochemical polymerization. And just when we did electro poly electrochemical polymerization, we already make the three layers, glass, ITO and whole transport layer. Now we put active layers and electron transport layer, aluminum, and we complete our device structure. So whole transport layer, we don't need to put separately, just during electropolymerization, we make up to this layer, up to whole transport layer, and then we make the another two layers, uh, then and complete the device structure. So this is the electrochemical polymerization technique, how you can deposit whole transport layer for the organic solar cell. And in this case, we are not using PSS, which is the main culprit for the device stability. So in this case, we have make a lot of device for large area also. And we found that our device much, much stable compared to PSS because the last in the table, last in the table and last uh, column, you can see when you use PSS, this device is unstable after 10 hours or after one day. But when you use electrochemical polymerization te technique, we have checked up to 2000 hours and it gives very high power conversion efficiency also good stability so this is one of the innovation that during electro uh, by using electrochemical polymerization we make a good whole transport layer for the stable and high power conversion organic solution so next another concept again i told you that the p dot this is insoluble material this black material this is insoluble polymer this is very good material but you cannot use this material in device because it's insoluble you cannot put the solid material in device you have to make it soluble in some solvent then you 
by different technique, uh, spin casting, blade coating. There is a lot of technique how you can make a polymer film on the IQ. But in this case, P dot you cannot do it. Again, you have to think some polymerization technique because I have some experience in uh, chemistry that we have think what kind of polymerization technique is available because we have developed some solid state polymerization. What is happen? The monomer is soluble. Okay, monomer is soluble, and you soluble your monomer in solvent. Then you put a film on the ITO. So you you make a film of the monomer in the poly in the, on ITO monomer on the ITO. Then you heat it, and it's it's form it form a polymer. You don't need any solvent, don't need any catalyst because this material has some unique property that after heating it will go self polymerization. So after heating again you make glass, ITO and whole transport layer. Then we add active layer and aluminum and you complete your device structure. So again we have a proposal, we have developed another technique by solid state polymerization. Just you dissolve your monomer in some solvent. Then you make a flame because monomer is soluble, polymer is not soluble, but monomer is soluble. You make a flame and then you put uh, on ITO and then you make a polymerization. Then you put active layer and aluminum complete your device structure. In this case also, we got very good uh, stability, but power conversion efficiency a little bit low because during polymerization, the bumin is liberated. So there is some hole it generated on the flame. So this technique good for stability but not good for uh, good for organic solar cell but this technique because this morphology of the polymer flame is not so good because the bomin is liberated during the polymerization so but this method is very good for perovskite solar cell which i not i'm going because meso porous perovskite but perovskite solar cell we need we do not need very good surface we need some rough surface but this technique technique is good for perovskite solar cell so in this case, again, I am telling that we are developing different kind of whole transport layer. So there is a lot of inorganic material and in literature like copper based material, they are deposited by thermal deposition. And we have also make it solution because thermal deposition is good for the small scale, uh, small scale device fabrication. But finally target to make it commercialization. So you have to go for at least some off grid application like mobile charger, laptop charger, not for grid connection some small application like uh, some uh, small application where you need very uh, small amount of energy of grid application so that's that case also you need some six by six inch area some device uh, device area so for this also we need solution process techniques so we also use different kind of uh, whole transport layer And this is the power conversion efficiency of this case. So we also got a good, very power conversion efficiency. And we finally, I told you that all are present in small, small area. It will give some current, which is not used for mobile charger or something uh, small application. Finally, you have to go for large area. You have to use the same technique. Just you have to increase the area to produce more current and more voltage and followed by then uh, uh, parallel and uh, uh, parallel and uh, parallel connection, uh, then you improve the you just tuning the voltage and current. So this is one of the technique how we can go for large area one inch by one inch. We have developed one inch by one inch in organic solar cell. Then <coughs> when we uh, connected by parallel or series, because if you go for, go for parallel, I think it will improve the current. When we, we go for series, it will improve the voltage. So at your requirement, you can tune in the voltage and current by connection by parallel and series. So this is one of the technique, how you can go for large area device fabrication. And sir, I have time, five minutes. Hello? Yes, sir. You have okay. So uh, uh, what I'm talking that this is for organic solar cell because last uh, five years, 10 years, that uh, organic solar cell, that time is very hot area. But uh, right now, perovskite is very hot area because most of the device people working in organic solar cell, they may move to perovskite because 
people working in last 10 years 20 years and uh, finally nothing's come very interesting in organic solar cell because the UG organic material main issue is stability power conversion efficiency is okay it's come around 10 to 20 percent and then people move to perovskite because perovskite is a very interesting and very hot area right now because last five years or 10 years it will give efficiency around um, around 22 percent in small area and all the material is very cheap in perovskite solar cell so obviously we also move a little bit from organic to perovskite so perovskite material just a b3 type material methyl ammonium lead iodide this is the perovskite material so device structure almost same organic solar cell and perovskite solar cell almost same just we replace the organic material by perovskite material rest of the part is almost same now we are working perovskite solar cell just we synthesize methyl methyl ammonium iodide just uh, methyl uh, uh, methyl amine plus hydrohydric acid we got methyl ammonium iodide and react with lead iodide we got the methyl ammonium iodide this is the structure and this is the acm image and this is our device structure glass fto here we are using fto instead of ito because for this we need nl means we need during device fabrication we need very high temperature around 400 degrees centigrade so that's why we are using fto and then we make the device fabrication so this is uh, our organic solar cell uh, perovskite solar cell we are working right now perovskite solar cell and uh, this is uh, uh, this is our perovskite solar cell and we got a efficiency around 15 percent right now in the uh, perovskite solar cell so uh, this is our device uh, fabrication facility uh, because as uh, this is the globe box in our laboratory uh, this is a globe box uh, we have two thermal deposition one for high temperature mainly we go for inorganic materials like uh, aluminum uh, gold uh, silver a lot of inorganic oxide like uh, moly oxide so this is high temperature low temperature organic materials uh, we also go for deposit and this is globe box and a lot of equipment at least 10 equipment already installed inside the globe box because totally all the device fabricate under inert condition spin cast uh, thermal temperature uh, uh, and encapsulation everything we can do do inside the globe box so this is one of the good facility we have uh, in our laboratory and uh, uh, in npl in the clean room and apart from this um, just i am telling that um, uh, csr also focus for uh, make it make in india because uh, to help uh, the indian uh, industry msme so in this direction we are trying to develop our, our own product actually so recently during this work we have developed a one technique uh, to synthesis p.pss so finally we have developed a new technique for the synthesis of p.pss and finally we have transferred this technique to some company in hyderabad and now we are working to make it commercialization and second things i am telling that uh, csr npl is a measurement institute means science of measurement metrology metrology means science of measurement because we have a lot of equipment in our laboratory like ftir UV, ACM, TEM, and sometimes people are not calibrate at all because you have to um, calibrate time to time after two years, three years, that the peak are in the correct position or not. So in this direction, this is FTR calibration polystyrene flame. We have developed at CSR NPL because initially we have Indian from the outside. Outside means abroad, mainly NIST USA because NIST is a, in India, NPL, NIST, the similar things for USA. They have sell to India at one piece is one lakhs. Now we have developed this uh, BND. It's called Bharatiya Nidosu Dabbo. It's reference material in our laboratory. And now we are selling for FTR calibration because not a lot of calibration laboratory, NEBL accreditation lab, testing lab, they need this. Uh, for R&D, we sometimes don't need exact calibration. But for uh, testing lab, they need proper calibration. So for this, we have de developed this BND, uh, and we are selling. In, this is fifteen thousand plus GST. Uh, and finally, thanks uh, to all of you. Also, thanks to my current student, former student, and uh, financial support mainly from CSR, also DST, and also my lab colleagues and uh, student. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Asit, for your nice presentation. 
is there any questions from the audience yes sir uh, there are three questions in the chat box uh, okay. asit please you uh, okay. please see and just uh, answer possible can one read actually Chat okay I, i am reading uh professor deepak ranjan mal uh, has questioned that is the sulfur atoms of polythiophene oxidizable to uh, sulfoxides ashida ashid can you hear Can you hear us? Here? Sir, uh, sir, uh, Oshit, um, Babu left way got in meeting today. Can you have a network disconnection? Maybe some problem in the network connection, maybe. Wait for a minute if he joins. Oh. Deepak, the hello chain. Ah, so if you want to show, then the chul come again. Let's check too. Huh? The chul come again. Ah, boys, what's it? Na? Na, I'm not sure. What's it? Ah, yes, yes. That one is make out what's it? मैं मंगलवार शुद्ध I think I think uh, he has missed. I think uh, okay, uh, he missed this. I mean, question answer session. But uh, could you could you connect him? No, this. Oh, you, you can phone him. You can phone him uh, if you have time. Otherwise, we will go to the next session. माइक्रोफोन There are few questions. If you just uh, answer. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Osita, first question is from uh, our sir, Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal. Yeah. Uh, is the sulfur atoms of polythiophene oxidizable to sulfoxides? Uh, sir, generally we have not observed any this kind of uh, oxid oxidation because I think in uh, thiophene is aromatic, sulfur is most stable. Uh, so we don't have any indication that it is oxidized to sulfoxide. Even we did not observe for selenium case also. Okay. Okay. Because I think it's aromatic case is much more difficult compared to aliphatic system. Uh, okay. Oxidation. Okay. Fine, fine. Okay. And the second question is uh, from Phalguni Thakur. Hmm. Ah, uh, she has a query that sir, my polymer and nano composites are poorly soluble in DMSO and TFA. May you please suggest better solvent for pyrrole and thiophene? 
uh, I think uh, for organic molecule, we are generally mainly use chlorinated aromatic solvent. Chlorinated aromatic organic molecules. Chlorinated aromatic solvent means chlorobenzene, dichlorobenzene. If it's not at all, then trichlorobenzene. But trichlorobenzene, if you use, then it's very difficult to remove. So generally, you can use chlorobenzene and dichlorobenzene. Or you maybe use mixed solvent because there is a nano. Nano may be good for a DMSO, DMAP, this kind of solvent. And organic material good for chlorine chlorinated solvent. You can try mixed solvent maybe. And uh, you can go for sonication if you sometimes you sonicate and uh, then or heat it to make it better soluble. Okay, and third question is from Shoro Shijadash. Why okay. regu regio regular P3HT is being formed from asymmetric 3HT? No, regio regular because ignore metathesis reaction. It, if, it will attack in the specific direction always. It is oil reported in literature. We are using not a simple oxidative polymerization. If you go for simple oxidative polymerization, then it will give a random, random polymerization. But when you go for Gignan metathesis, it will always generally give, uh, give the regular polymer. And it, we have also characterized by NMR because the chain, the first two hydrogen in the polymer chain, C6H13, the first two hydrogen, this if it's regular, it will give a particular single peak. If it's not a regular, then you can find the two peaks. And uh, the ratio of the two peaks, integration of the two peaks, you can define the, what is the percentage of the regular. By an NMR, you can find it, uh, it's regular or not, for potent NMRs. Clearly, indication, uh, you can find it. Okay, there is no more question. Okay, so uh, there is no more questions. So, uh, Asit, <coughs> I have just a uh, query actually. Okay, what, so I mean, what is your feeling about this this perovskite uh, as a solar cell? I mean, uh, I mean, with respect to future, because there yes, are many I, things from science. As for example, uh, when I started my career, C uh, sixty was uh, very popular. I mean, yeah, everybody yeah. is trying C sixty. And there are some special journals on also on C60 like that actually even in our yeah. country also. Okay. So, uh, so as you are started uh, working on this, just your yeah. comment. Sir, actually when I joined that time, first can also start. Okay, that time efficiency around three four percent, and last five years it's then it increased to twenty two percent and twenty one percent in large, a small area, and also large area also eighteen percent nineteen percent is reported. There are two main issues in the perovskite. One is in perovskite, people are using lead, lead material. So lead is toxic. Mainly, most of the country like Europe, they may be not allowed to enter the lead. But people are working to replace the lead because a lot of material, uh, tin, uh, gallium, some material, they are used as a replacement of lead. But still, lead is the champion material. People are using other material and make a device and this device is not so good as lead but maybe future people can overcome it and second thing is stability stability also not so far good for the real application because if you make some device and you demonstrate for one month and two months is okay but mm. when you sell in the market at least you need two years stability for upgrade application if you go for great application like silicon solar cell, which have 90% market right now, uh, which is 50 years back to technology, silicon solar cell. And there is so far 90% market in the silicon solar cell. And that and people are much more interested in perovskite right now. The material is very cheap, flexible, but two issues, one is plate, second is stability. Maybe okay. stability people can uh, overcome because Initially, the solar cell well comes. All the device fabrication made under glove box, moisture sensitive. Now people have developed, uh, developed some technique, perovskite. This is also stable in moisture. And uh, people are, uh, because in perovskite, there is some organic moiety also there, methyl ammonium. And now people are replaced this method, methyl ammonium, but cesium cation, cesium cation, I think. So totally inorganic material. So I think they can improve the uh, stability also. So this is one uh, things. 
and actually our case efficiency is good but uh, we are not working uh, stability also right now uh, mm -hmm. and large area also not so difficult because now what people are looking uh, silicon perovskite tend down because silicon solar cell is 20% 25% reported now people are make perovskite on the silicon solar cell to improve 1% suppose there is a billion or billion market of silicon solar cell in in india if you improve 1% it is a huge impact mm -hmm. if you have 20% efficiency and it's it's goes to 21% then it's a huge impact because the market is huge because now most of the government uh, institute they have a silicon uh, installation of the silicon panel so if you improve 1% it is a huge impact so now people are try to make a uh, perovskite on the silicon solar cell silicon perovskite tandem solar cell yeah okay so this is a new reaction okay so thanks uh, both uh, onindo as well as ashit for your nice presentation thank you very much okay thank you sir thank you onindo sir thank you everyone so, we thank professor nilmoni sarkar for chairing the session and also our distinguished speakers for delivering very nice and informative lectures thank you very much sir thank you sir thank, thank you. you sir thank you everyone session one is uh, session one is over now and we are now moving towards the second technical session which is for the oral presentation from the participants the presentations uh, will be reviewed by professor deepak ranjan mal Uh, from former professor of department of chemistry of iit kharagpur and professor subhash chandra bhattacharya former professor of department of chemistry jadavpur university the three best oral presenters will be felicitated at the end of the webinar but before starting the session 2 uh, i am happy to inform you about a book written by professor deepak ranjan mal professor mal has expressed his experience about anionic annulations in this book named anionic annulations in organic synthesis i request you sir to tell us a few words about this book okay uh okay uh you see the uh, you see the slide there uh the uh, the caption is uh, anionic annulations in organic synthesis and annulation is uh, completely different from the cyclizations which are often used for the synthesis of cyclic compounds which constitute 80% of the total medicinal uh, medicinal drugs or pharmaceutical drugs so uh, cyclic compounds are very important and for preparing uh, cyclic compounds one can use cyclizations and, uh, and the other second method is annulation means where you can form two bonds together and a new ring and on this topic there was no book in the literature so this is the first of its kind but i have restricted the discussion to anionic because the uh, most popular reactions belong to the anionic classes anionic class okay so and uh, annulation have been exposed to the undergraduates through robinson annulations but beyond that there are some, uh, more than 30 different annulations uh, which are often used in organic synthesis so i thought it would be fitting to uh, give a comprehensive review or uh, on the annulations so uh, kindly have a look at the book and give your feedback at the address given or, or the mail address given thank you very much okay sir thank you now we are starting the second session this session will be chaired by professor deepak ranjan mal all the speakers are allotted with 8 minutes time a warning ring will be given at 7 minutes the speakers okay. are requested to adhere the time schedule participants are free to ask the queries in the chat box naming the speaker all the speakers are also requested to reply the queries in the chat box naming the participant at the end of the webinar the queries will be summarized and communicated to all the participants let me announce the name of today's presenters 
How, how many are there? There, there are fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, fine. Uh, you are requested to be present here accordingly. Uh, 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 I am uh, <coughs> reading the names. Doctor Loki Ganto Dash. Yes, ma'am. I am present. Okay. Uh, Pavel Banerji, Koushula Nagaraja, Dr. Debolina Sharkar, Dr. Shoumen Sharkar, Dr. Omar Hens, Dr. Dhrubajyoti Mondor, uh, Shayon Nita Panja, Pooja Rani Kuri, Kuri sorry, Shuparno Devnath, Mrs. Tomogni Manna, uh, Mr. Shoumo Sinharai, Shubhajit Kundu, Mitra Proto Goshami and Joydev Gowra. Who is this past speaker? Uh, Loki Kantodar. So okay. now I welcome Professor Mal to chair the uh, session. Sir, please. Okay. Hello, everybody. And special hello to Professor uh, Shubhash Chandra Bhattacharya. And, uh, and so we we'll together do the job. Okay. Uh, let us start with the uh, first speaker. Uh, first speaker is Loki Kantu. Uh, please Dad. start your lecture. Yes, sir. I am present. Is it visible? Yes, 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 yes. And start? Uh, yes, yes, start. Okay. Uh, yes, good, morning start. To, uh, good morning to everyone. Now I am going to present my paper entitled Synthesis of a Heterometallic Copper 2 Mercury 2 Helical Coordination Polymers, the Metallolike and Approach. First, I discuss what is heterometallic complex. Actually, depending on the nuclearity, complexes can be classified into two categories. One is mononuclear complex and another one is polynuclear complex. Now, polynuclear complexes may be two types. One is homometallic where all metal are same and another is heterometallic in which at least two metals are different. Now, what is metalloligand? Actually, metalloligand means a metal complex which itself can act as a ligand. As for example, here I have shown a saline type sieve base ligand. It is N2O2 donor tetradentate sieve base ligand, which is derived from the 1 is to 2 condensation of salicylaldehyde and ethylene diamine. When this type of CBS ligand is allowed to react with a bivalent metal ion, it results a mononuclear chelate. In this chelate, the metal is bonded with two nitrogen atom and two oxygen atom of the CBS ligand, resulting the square planar arrangement around the metal center. Here, it is clear that the oxygen atoms which are bonded to metal atoms still contain lone pair of electron and which are easily be donated to another heterometal ion. Thus, this mononuclear chelate itself act as a ligand and we term that, we termed this complex as a metalloligand. Nowadays, Metalloligand approach have been widely used to synthesize heterometallic complexes. As for example, the heterometallic dinuclear complexes are formed when the oxygen atoms of one metalloligand coordinate to the heterometal ion along with the counter anion. Similarly, the trinuclear complexes are resulted when the oxygen atoms of two metal ligand coordinate to the heterometal ion along with the counter ion. And tetranuclear complexes, tetranuclear complexes are produced when the oxygen atom of three such metal ligand coordinate to the heterometal ion along with the counter ion. In this slide, I have shown the synthesis of 
copper mercury heterometallic helical coordination polymer using a copper based metallo ligand and mercuric nitrate as a heterometal ion and azide ion as a counter anion or anionic coligand here uh, we have started from a saline type c based ligand which is derived from the 1 is to 2 condensation of salicylaldehyde and 1 3 propanediamine when the resulting ligand is allowed to react to it cupric perchlorate in the presence of triethyl amine base in methanol medium it results a mononuclear chelate which is known as copper based metallo ligand when this metallo ligand is allowed to react with mercuric nitrate and sodium azide in methanol water mixture medium in the 1 is to 1 is to 2 molar ratio then it results our 1d helical coordination polymers Yes, here I have shown the crystal structure of the resulting complexes. This is the orte view of the dinucleate unit present in these coordination polymers. In this dinucleate unit, the mercury ion is bonded with the two phenoxido oxygen atom uh, from metallo ligand and two nitrogen atoms. Uh, from acidoligand. As a result, the coordination environment or geometry around the mercury ion is seesaw like arrangement. And these dinuclear cores are joined by the mu 1 1 acido bridge between the copper and mercury to form 1D helical chain. In this picture, I have uh, presented the helical view of this polymer. This is the M, heli M helix and this is the P helix. Okay. But in conclusion, we have successfully synthesized the copper mercury heterometallic coordination polymers using metalloligand strategy. The crystal structure analysis reveals that it is a 1D helical coordination polymer constructed by the joining of dinuclear units through the mu 1 1 acido bridges between the copper and mercury centers. These are the references, and I wish to express my sincere gratitude to my PhD supervisor, Professor Asutos Ghos, and all of the teachers of our department. And finally, thank you to all for your kind attention. There is one question sir, in the chat box, Roxy Gato. Yes, sir. Uh, this is my question. Uh, why do people actually stick to salicylaldehyde, uh, you know, chips based? Wherever I go, all the ligands, most of the ligands are based on salicylaldehyde. There could be many other orthohydroxyaldehyde and aromatic based. Uh, yes, sir. Item? This is also can be used. But this can be used. As for example, I presented this. But uh, all kind of ligands can be used. No, that's fine. But uh, can you uh, thought of, can you think, uh, think about any other um, I mean readily available ligand? Uh, yes, this is, the... uh, okay, okay. yes, yes. This is also a reason. This is easily available, cheap, and uh, very uh, very cheap actually, and easily available. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other, any other questions, Shubha? Sir, there are uh, two questions, but uh, Loki Gampa is requested to answer in the chat box. Actually, okay, we fine. are... Okay, fine, 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 fine. Go ahead. Go, go, go for the next one, then. Uh, next speaker is Pavel Banerjee, uh, research scholar from IIT Kharagpur, West Bengal.
हेलो पवेल स्टार्ट प्लीज अनम्यूट योर माइक्रोफोन पावेल हेलो यस यस सर कैन यू सी माय स्लाइड यस 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 नो प्रॉब्लम स्टार्ट स्टार्ट यस सर गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरीवन नाउ आई एम गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट माय वर्क एंटाइटल्ड एज एजिंग डिपेंडेंट मॉर्फोलॉजिकल क्रिस्टलिनिटी डिटरमाइन मेम्ब्रेन एक्टिविटी ऑफ एल्फिनल एलन सेल सेल असेंबली इन रीसेंट 20 इयर्स इन पास्ट 20 इयर्स द सेल असेंबली और द एग्रीगेशन ऑफ protein like abita 42 insulin tau alpha synuclein lysozyme uh, is uh, the cause of many neurodegenerative disorders like alzheimer disease type 2 diabetes and parkinson disease and the most threatening thing is there is no cure till date for that type of neurodegenerative disorder and in 2012 gajit group from israel they have uh, also, also reported that not only protein and peptide the but also single amino acid like l phenyl alanine can also self assembled in that type of fibrillar structures and with same cytotoxic and with same amylodegenic property like protein and peptide fibrils and following the in the following work kuslani and coworkers have also established that tyrosine that l tyrosine also can form that type of structure and due to that structure formation you see this is l phenyl alanine fibril deposition in cornea feet and brain and this this neurodegenerative disorder for excess l phenyl alanine is called as phenyl ketonuria so what is the basic uh, driving force between the behind the fibril formation of that uh, that type of fibril formation actually there are non covalent interactions like hydrogen bonding uh, pi pi stacking so they are very very weak individually but when they are collected in space it can uh, form the large structure or uh, we can uh, just uh, the second example like caliber travels the small people when they are collected they can capture galliver travel and according to jm lane uh, the one of the pioneer of supramolecular chemistry the study of self assembly is a major discipline of chemistry now more focus to my work i am going to discuss about amyloid polymorphism what is polymorphism polymorphism means the self assembly structure can exist in more than one form in my work i will discuss about fibril and crystal you see from the same structure that is untwist into crystal and again they can form nanotube in the recent work of rafael a magenta group from eth jury they have uh, they have placed amyloid crystal in the minimum of the energy profile diagram so amyloid crystal is the most stable structure in the amyloid self assembly state so this is the basic instrument i have used that is fluorescence coefficient spectroscopy in fluorescence light time imaging they are actually a single molecule based technique and i am divided my presentation in two form in part a the polymorphic behavior of elfinal and cell assembly and in part b the change in membrane activity due to the polymorphism and probable reason behind that in the part a that is polymorphism polymorphic behavior of elfinal and cell assembly so this is the chemical structure of elfinal alanine and this is the chemical structure of dcm that is the fluorophore i have used to monitor the cell assembly structure of elfinal alanine via fluorescence microscopy so a uh, different polymorphs of elfinal alanine this is hrt images when we uh, taken hrt images of instantly prepared elfinal alanine sample which i have we have observed two type of morphology a net like morphology again a rod like morphology when we employed the uh, selected area diffraction study we have observed that that a helical fibrillar net like morphology actually amorphous so these are the fibrils and the rod like morphology actually the, the in the sid pattern they have dots so they are crystallized So when I we allow the sample to settle down that on aging, that is one day sample and seven day sample, we have surprisingly we have observed only crystalline property. 
So this is solely crystals. And when we have uh, uh, again prepare the sample in higher elevated temperature, we have also seen the crystalline property. So only in instant sample, there are amorphous nature or fibrillar nature is there. But when uh, upon aging or in the elevated temperature, they are solely crystal. And this is the PXRD. And PXRD, uh, powder XRD, we have calculated the degree of crystallinity using this formula in origin 9 software. And we have uh, observed that for the instant sample, the degree of crystallinity is 32 percent. Whereas uh, upon aging, the crystallinity increases to 60 percent, and in elevated temperature, it is highest, that is 71 percent. So this increase in the, the crystallinity is increasing, and due to the, the larger peak generation or intensity of peak is gained greater. And again, we have applied polarization microscopy studies. You see, for the one day and 60 degree centigrade sample, the changing color with the polarization angle changing of the optical microscope. So actually, the colors come from the different planes of crystal. But is no color change is observed in each kind sample. So it actually reflects that that one day and 60 degree sample actually crystalline sample, whereas instant sample is amorphous sample. Again, we have this is the process lifetime imaging microscopy. We have observed that the instant and six hour samples are homogeneous. This is lifetime distribution plotted from the lifetime images. You see this single Gaussian distribution. Whereas for the rod like assemblies, that is upon aging and elevated temperature, it is heterogeneous and deconvoluted into two Gaussian functions. Uh, so it is heterogeneous sample. We have also uh, monitored also measured Young's modulus, and from Young's modulus measurement, we have observed that, that this type of structure is actually very compact and steep structure. It, uh, the, again, the elevated temperature sample, that is L-phenylene 60 degree centigrade sample, and have the steepness compared to pure glass. So this is the part B, that is change in membrane activity. We have used this particular phospholipid to make model membrane. Again, this is the only model membrane and this is the lifetime distribution from slim image. And when we have uh, employed instant phenylalanine sample into model membrane, you see the change in shape of the vesicle and the lifetime distribution becomes heterogeneous. So it actually reflects that there is uh, a strong perturbation by the instant, that is five wheel sample upon the membrane, whereas the one day sample, that is crystalline sample, has very minimal effect. You see in this image, this is the uh, addition of fibril sample, you see this elongation. This elongation actually reinforces the incorporation of the instant sample into the vesicle. Again, from the single molecule FCS study, we have observed that the diffusion time actually becomes three times faster in presence of this fibril sample of l which actually, uh, we can conclude that that fibril sample uh, actually part of the membrane significantly. From the anisotropy imaging, we have this is the setup of anisotropy imaging. We have also observed that in the anisotropy imaging, the anisotropy actually becomes very faster in presence of instant fibril in, instant sample, that is the fibril sample of the phenyl ring. And in probable region, we have done some quantum chemical calculation. Quantum chemical calculation shows that is if this is the Gibbs energy delta G for monomer, uh, uh, dimer, trimer, tetramer. We have observed for tetramer, there are tetramer is mostly stable, and for tetramer, there is multilayer aggregation is there. And uh, for that multilayer aggregation, the n terminal charge of phenylalanine actually decreases. As the charge decreases, the electrostatic interaction between L phenylalanine and membrane actually decreases. So, the rod like structure, that is multilayer structures, actually less active to membrane, whereas the fibrillar structure is active to membrane. So this paper actually now revision under JVC letter. Uh, I will uh, thank you acknowledge my supervisor, co-worker, lab mate, then family, CSR for fellowship, Department of Chemistry, KCRE College and Conference Committee for giving me this platform. Uh, thank you all for hearing me and thank you chemistry for giving me the platform. Uh, any question? I think apparently I, I don't see any questions in the uh, chat box though. Yes, sir. Professor Mal, I am asking one question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Question. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, I am asking uh, him one question. That is, yes, he, mentioned that, he mentioned the temperature at 60 degrees centigrade. Uh, yes, sir. To Christianity. So, have you, yes, have, you, have you observed what is the effect if the temperature is above 60 degrees? Uh, yes, sir. Actually, uh, uh, the report is there after in the 37 after above the 37 degree centigrade temperature. l phenylalanine has a phase transition temperature behind that. That is the amorphous structure and that. So okay. then uh, we have to we have uh, monitor this 60 degree. But above 60 degree, there are reported 90 degree centigrade by Gadget group. 
but ever nitrogen syndicate sir when we are cooling to room temperature there are solid crystal formation is there so to be safe we have observed we have monitored that in situ this in case oh yes i am asking for that yes yes sir yes okay there is no more question abhi uh, thank you very much thank you sir thank you sir uh, go to the next speaker uh, our next speaker is uh, koshula nagaraja research scholar from yogi vemana university andhra pradesh okay ma'am good morning madam how to share ppt madam uh, you go to you go to present now at the okay okay madam below of the of your screen okay enter the screen share share there is no share share your screen okay madam um, Yes, it's it okay. coming. No, it is not. Kajin, share. Enter lab. Uh, Kosal, uh, Kosal, you first to open your PPT, and uh, then uh, you should try present now. Okay, okay sir. Yeah. No, 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 do not do to stop presenting. Uh, you should open your PPT first. Yes, okay, sir. First, open your PPT. Yes, sir. Then um, present now a window. Sir, already PPT open, sir. and now do again present now okay just okay sir how to share sir you present have done now. present now okay good morning no 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 no, no, no it is not seen please uh, present now go to present now uh, right corner below in your screen okay 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 sir then click a window okay yes yes okay okay Okay, sir. Hi. Yes. 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 It is start. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good morning to. Good morning. Today I give presentation on sensor subtrag and based hydrogel cellular nano composite hydrogel network for antimicrobial and drug delivery application. Just to my research outcome, we briefly explain. Now, uh, uh, question or uh, louder, please. Okay, yes, sir. just briefly introduction and characterization method material and methods on uh, results and discussion and conclusion briefly introduction hydrogel hydrogel first reported by wickler and lin in 1960 hydrogel is one of the famous integer crossing hydrophilic polymeric network uh, it is a three dimensional polymeric network it is containing large content of biological fluids hydrogel's potential application due to i hydrophilic city biocompatibility similar to natural tissue chelating nature stimuli response to nature but stimuli response rate also depends on various parameters ion exchange metal temperature ph electric field so on sir and now hydrogel is applied in hydrogel is applied in various fields it is the drug delivery electrical devices agriculture food industry tissue engineering water purification cosmetic it is my user interface louder 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 kosula okay sir Uh, now i can hear uh, okay a briefly introduction polymers and monomers trigonal gum it is a natural occurring polysaccharide it is excluded from the bark of gummifer 
it is a great property such as a non toxicity biodegradability in biocompatible stabilizing agent in ml spin agent it is can be used in various applications drug like delivery tissue engineering electronic cosmetics just another nice problem amad is a good temperature response in monomer it is excited and low critical solution temperature it is unique based on just temperature another mon monomer is ethylene glycol monomethyl it is a plant based monomer extracted from the soybean oil it is a great property such as by bio, biodegradability and biocompatibility this advantage is of control tech release Advantage of many control drug releases, genes reduce and side effects and reduce and doses from increase and in drug efficacy, improved on bioavailability and better patients of complaints. Just our chosen 5-fluorouracil drug. It is the anti-cancer drug. It is pyramid and unlock chemotherapeutic agent. It is widely used in various cancer treatments like just bladder cancer, breast cancers, gastric cancers, melanoma lung cancer. It is the short biological half-life. Five fluoracil is a limitation short of life, serious toxicity, low bioavailability, can cause serious side effects, burn narrow, gastrointestinal tract, the central nervous system. Another application is the silver nanoparticles. Nanoparticles have extensive broad range of applications. They are excellent on outcome outstanding characteristics such as high catalytic activity, large surface volume, maximum number of active sites in surface area. So another one used on various application antibacterial activity, wound healing, packaging, plastic, uh, plastics, drug delivery. There may since is dragon based hydrogel so feed composition just different uh, concentration of uh, in cross linker. The first fall the dragon gum aqua solution various monomers and monomers and cross linker. Uh, so stirring continuously for homogeneous mixer after palm added initiator. The vinyl groups to radical polymerization carried out at room temperature. They get palm gel. Uh, this gel is uh, washed with uh, twice double distilled water after dried in further studies were used. After, this gel is used in green synthesis of silver nanocomposites. It is the reducing agent to silver uh, extracted natural plant. It is good stabilizing agent and uh, uh, reducing agent. Characterization. FTR spectroscopy, just on figure, FTR spectroscopy, just pure drag and the gum, just composite to pure hydrogels and pure drug composites, uh, drug composite cytogels, relief extract, slow nano composite cytogel. Just peak oil stretching frequency observed at uh, 3, 4, 46 centimeters inverse oil stretching. Another one is the 17, 20 centimeters and is the carboxyl mighty peaks. The 1658 on NS stretching and 1458, 1248 uh, carbon nitrogen bending vibrations. And then it's a five pure FTR spectroscopy is there, just uh, drug composite hydrogels, carbon fluorine stretching frequency also at 1238 and 811 centimeters inverse. Confirm the FTR spectroscopy. Another spectra is where FTR spectroscopy. The X FTR spectroscopy is used in pure composite hydrogels, pure drug. A drug composite side hydrogel, the still nano composite side hydrogel. Drug composite side hydrogel exhibit and two theta value around 18, 24, 13, 38 degrees. Still nano composite side hydrogel exhibit and two theta values 31, 38, 44, 64, 77 degrees. The sharp peak observed in 38.32 degrees. It is a peak mighty to be crystalline amorphous nature in hydrogel network. Further studies, EV visible spectroscopy, just uh, pure extract and slow nano composites hydrogel. This uh, change in color of light yellow to dark brown color at room temperature. Uh, the drug load uh, just composites hydrogels all are around the UV absorption peak around at 425 to 435 nanometers. It is surface plasma and in intensively depends on dielectric medium, practical size, and chemical surrounding. So another spectrum. Another characterization is same and same. The just pure hydrogel is smooth surface area. It is uh, due to high hydrophilic nature. The another shown figure bitter composite hydrogel. This shown figure C1, silo nano composite hydrogel. It is the edax analysis of edax spectrum of shown figure D. The ENF is MMAS, the acid pattern of state MMAS. Another one is silo nano composite hydrogel. This average particle size as good at 24 nanometers. In vitro drug release studies were carried out to, to, to different pH conditions. First one, pH 1.2, another 7.4. At also two different pH, uh, two, uh, two different two temperatures on 25 degrees and 37 degrees. Just first, uh, pH 74 is more drug release than composition 5. 
it is compared to pH 1.2. Why reason is to more hydrophilic nature of oak and anionic polysaccharide and monomer concentration. <laughs> The introductory studies for kinetic models. It is the best in kinetic models in Prosmer, Pepas, and Egoch model. It is a quick and deposition me mechanism. This antimicrobial activity is shown good, uh, excellent, and antimicrobial activity. It is the Klebsiella pneumoniae, is a gram negative bacteria, good, excellent bacteria activity. The electrostatic ripples in between positive charged cellular ions, negatively charged all cell membranes, microorganisms. Conclusion. Hydrogels were successfully prepared by pre radical polymerization. Some images of pure hydrogels contain smooth surface area, silo nano composites, hydrogels, pure shape. Where silo nano particles confirm the EV, XRD, and TEMI average particle size observed 24 nanometers. Maximum drug release was observed 91% in over the past eight hours. It is a pick and diffusion mechanism. It is ego and Cosmere models were best fitted and released compared to other kinetic models. It is good, ex excellent activity. <laughs> Acknowledgement. I am sincerely thanks to Dr. K. S. Krishna Rao, my research supervisor, Yoga University. FTR and U is available in my lab. Same also available in our university. I am thankful to Dr. K. Masudanda, Department of Palmer Science, Ingham University, and help me to get M characterization. I am also thankful to the Department of Physics, provide me XRD. Thank you. We, do, we, do, we don't find any questions in the chat box. Ashula? Sir, tell me, sir. You have said that your uh, poly, uh, gum is highly toxic. So how can it be used? What, sir? Your synthesized gum is highly toxic, you are saying. So if it is toxic, then how will, can it be used? Just the gel is taken water to 48 hours in cell in gel, sir. After removing any monomers and reactant to toxic metals removed, sir. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Go to the, uh, go to the next one. Okay, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Devlina Shwarkar, Assistant Professor from Bagnan College. I start. Hello. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, myself, Dr. Devlina Shorkar from Department of Chemistry, Bagnan College. A very good afternoon to all of you present here. Today, my work of uh, presentation will be sequential detection of aluminium three plus. F minus based on a noble coumarin sketch with application in bioimaging. So I have chosen aluminium 3 plus because it is of utmost importance from both environmental as well as biologic point of view. And moreover, uh, the aluminium 3 plus sensors, most of them reported they suffer a strong interference due to uh, mercury 2. And uh, the resulting complex of aluminium 3 plus and our chemo sensor act as a sequential detector for F minus by quenching of emission intensity. So I'm moving to the synthetic methods, the chemosensor H2L, where we have taken this 3-acetyl-4-hydroxycumarin condensed liquid hydrazine in 1 to 1 molar ratio, where we isolated this thing HL. Then this HL is being further condensed with 2-hydroxy-3,5-dimethylbenzaldehyde in nonic medium for 8 hours, where we finally isolated the chemosensor H2L. This is the 1 e NMRs of H2L recorded in CDCL3. Uh, this is the mass spectra of the free receptor H2L, and uh, this is the mass spectra of the uh, aluminium 3 plus complex with the receptor H2L, where we found two peaks at 438 and at, at around 474. Uh, 474 for the complex. This is the 1H NMR spectra of the clips recorded in DMSO B6 medium. Uh, 
Now, the mainly the cation sensing studies have been done using spectroscopic techniques, and here is the UVB spectrum of H twelve, where we have added gradually aluminium three plus, and we obtain this peak at three eighty five uh, nanometer. This is a new absorption band upon addition of aluminium three plus. We have recorded the UVB spectra of aluminium three uh, of H twelve in presence of various other metal ions also. Here. This is emission spectra of the free receptor upon gradual addition of aluminium three plus, where we found that the emission intensity increases several folds at around 610 nanometers. This is the emission spectra of the free receptor upon gradual addition of several other metal ions, but we found this uh, high increase in enhancement of emission intensity is specific only in case of aluminium three plus. Here we have recorded the emission intensity of the chemo sensor upon addition of several other metal ions, this 610 nanometers. But we found that uh, upon addition of aluminium three plus to that very same pot, only this emission intensity is uh, enhancement in intensity is obtained. Thus, we can conclude that the uh, designed receptor H12 can detect aluminium three plus even in the presence of several other metal ions. The job plot. Shows uh, maxima at 0.5, which indicates one is to one complex formation. The limit of detection of our uh, receptor for the metal ion has been found in the range 10 to the power minus 8 molar. The binding constant is in the order of 10 to the power 5 molar, mole inverse. <clears throat> From the anion sensing studies, this is the UV based spectra of H12 in presence of different ions. Uh, and this is the emission intensity of the complex to which we have added F minus, and we found that quenching of emission intensity occurs at 610 nanometers. This is the uh, emission intensity of complex upon addition of various anions, followed by the addition of F minus, where we found that this decrease in emission intensity is obtained. The pink bars. Now the sensing mechanism has been mainly studied theoretically by DFT, where we found that uh, these are the possible intramolecular proton transfer which can take place in the free receptor. We have calculated the relative energy of the various keto and enol using potential energy scan, and we found that the energy difference between these various keto and enol form is quite less, and this proton transfer process is quite facile in the ground state. So basically, this ESIVT process is actually responsible for the emission of for the uh, decrease in emission intensity. Upon uh, coordination with the metal ion, this uh, proton transfer process is getting hampered, and we obtain an increase in emission intensity. This is the pH of uh, pH current fluorescence intensity. The black one represents that of the free receptor, where we found that the emission intensity decreases at pH four. At around pH four, whereas in case of the complex, this is uh, quite high. After nine, uh, the complex is getting decomposed, and hence this decrease in emission intensity. And the green one is that of the uh, addition of anion to the complex. I have used in, uh, it in several cell lines. Uh, this is this here. I have done this MPT assay to analyze that the complex as well as the free receptor is quite. Not toxic in a considerable range. Here, this diagram A it represents a fluorescence image of A549, which is human lung cancer cell line upon incubation with both the receptor as well as aluminium three plus. It is showing this brilliant red emission intensity. Uh, similarly, this F, uh, this B and C are the corresponding bright field image and the merged merged field images. This F is that of the AGS cell line, again incubated with uh, the receptor as well as aluminium three plus. These are the corresponding G and H are the corresponding bright and much field uh, pictures. This D represents the fluorescence image of normal rat lung tissue upon incubation of both the receptor as well as the chemo sensor, as well as that of aluminium three plus. This is the E represents that of malignant rat lung tissue. I represents that uh, um, malignant gastric tissue. All the four pictures they have been incubated with the receptor as well as the aluminium three plus and showing this bright red emission type the tissues as well as cell line. The same study has been done with breast cancer cell line. This is with MCH seven where we again found this bright red 
emission in case of uh, incubation with the complex. Uh, this is the waste cancer tissue, where is again it's shown this bright red emission. Finally, I would like to acknowledge TRB New Delhi for providing financial support. Dr. Nobindu Murmo, Senior Scientific Officer, Department of HTBA, CNCI Kolkata, Professor Shoma Mukhopadhyay, Teacher in Charge, Bhagavan College, Haura, and also to CNCI and Jadavpur University for providing structural facilities. Finally, a very big thank you to all of you for your patience. Thank you. Uh, Bevelina, uh, is it done in Bagran College and uh, by independently? No, no, sir. No, sir. Actually, uh, it was uh, uh, I. Uh, I joined Bagran College, but before that, I started doing this work at at uh, National. Exactly, sir. Okay. Have you observed, have you observed the effect, direct effect of fluoride ion? On the ligand, no, the no. fluorescent spectra of the ligand. If you add directly fluoride ion, no, it was not showing this quenching. Yes. Upon uh, addition, that is to the complex effect. only. It was showing this quenching. That means in the complex is fluorescent and then fluoride ion access quencher. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a question actually uh, regarding the characterization of your ligand. And uh, what I see that uh, there is a peak beyond 2.9 delta value in NMR. Uh, hopefully, it is corresponding to the aromatic methyl group, uh, but it is a little doubtful though. Normally, they come below 2.5. So, uh, yes, uh, actually, if you always protons, they do uh, like that, but here I have obtained it around 2.9. Uh, around two. Yes, sir. Uh, but I, I, two point yeah, nine. That's a little high, though. Quite a little, uh, remarkably high. In, it, maybe, maybe it's getting deshielded. Maybe it's uh, getting but, deshielded. Uh, but, uh, but you have a OH group which is actually will be shielding, not deshielding. You don't have an electron withdrawing group uh, to cause deshielding. Okay, you think about it. Okay. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, I am not sure. Just uh, I'm telling you okay. that uh, this. You, you, can, you, can, you can mail me the spectrum. If, uh, okay, uh, I, I'll check. Okay, sir. Sir, I can't get you. Sir, will you repeat? Well, no, you'll find it there. In uh, okay, uh, okay. Ask Sudapa. Yes. Okay, okay, sir. Okay. Thank okay. Goodbye. You, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for presentation. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay, we are calling the, our next speaker, Dr. Shomen Sharkar, Assistant Professor of Balurghat College. Uh, good afternoon, my respected teachers. I am present here. Good afternoon to all. Uh, present now. Is my slide is visible now? Is my slide is visible now? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Again, uh, myself Shomen Sharkar from Balurghat College. My topic of presentation today is use of magnetic nanocatalyst for library synthesis of functionalized pyrrole fused tumarine derivatives under one pot condensation reaction. Uh, we all know that coumarin derivatives have immense importance in scientific arena from different areas. Uh, it is widely distributed in nature. It has a diverse range in biological activities such as, such as cytotoxicity, HIV, integrase inhibition, anti-cancerous properties. Uh, Adjocumastan is a very well-known natural product. It is a material of indolocoumarin and it is reported for potential molecule against the anti-tumoral uh, activities. Tumorin derivatives also shows excellent photophysical properties and it's, it's used for different 
laser dyes and fluorescent leveling probe we already know about this so it is a potential field of interest to research here i present some important naturally occurring compounds of this fused pyrolocumarin derivatives they are never in the anti cancer agents and aristocumarin very much isn't present here in science now the first part of my work is interest is magnetic nanoparticles uh, it is not a new concept now but it is not widely used also so many areas are still to explore here i present some importance of magnetic nanoparticle catalyst it is as it is less explored than heterogeneous catalyst but it also has a high surface area it's good thermal stability easy recovery from by external magnetic force it's a very important point so it is cost effective and also reusable which makes it more green for environment and that's the our new goal of research today is the green synthesis the simple uh, some simple uh, representative uh, molecule like like iron oxide coated with silica and then uh, acidic part which is the some example which i present here in every example there is generally a core of iron oxide or cobalt iron oxide inside that is coated with a uh, silicon oxide or zirconium oxide material outside and then a doping of acidic sites like uh, sulfuric sulfurous acidic site using chlorosulfonic acid etc so it is an highly active acidic site outside which is a protonic in nature and inside is a magnetic core that makes it separable and solid so it is heterogeneous uh, i represent here a very representative pathway of preparing all this material uh, one general procedure is taking iron oxide coated with silica and sulfurous oxide the first we prepare the core materials iron oxide coated silica material and then dope the acidic site using chlorosulfonic acid and then it was uh, characterized by various techniques like uh, say scanning electron microscope tem edx hrd fpir vsm obviously i am not an expert in on this uh, industry uh, instrumental field i have to take help from other experts in different institute for this experiments here i present the material uh, tem image and same image uh, characteristic image analysis same image of this material confirms the spherical and uniform size of the material and from tem image also we find the size which is uh, nearly 30 to 40 uh, nanometer in scale and precise size of the molecule and tem image was repeated for the first time in the structure b you can find that it is the initial tem image of the uh, nano catalyst and this picture c represents the tem image after seven time use of the material on is characteristics also this core cell model it maintain the core cell model after seven time use of in the reaction and here i present uh, the edx analysis of this which showed the peak of sulfur that means the doping of sulfurous group in the surface proved by this analysis now come to the second part that is the synthetic part uh, obviously after rigorous uh, different uh, methodical experiments we found the standard condition of this reaction Here we use and uh, first an glyoxal molecule and an aryl amine and that reaction with an amino coumarin. So it is a three component reaction. Initially a, a reaction with an glyoxal amine and uh, glyoxal and amine and coumarin is made by this uh, magnetic nanoparticle in a solvent free condition and say 60 degree temperature. The time of the reaction is one hour roughly. We have done many. the uh, compound roughly 25 examples of this species was reported and time is so varying time from 1 to 2 hours so doesn't i doesn't mention that here but the standard reaction is this for preparing this uh, fused pyrolocumarin derivative also a second type of pyrolocumarin derivative is uh, um, made by this similar standard reaction condition but here we use uh, the activate active methylene compound instead of the amine uh, with the same glyoxal and coumarin and get a different kind of pyrolocumarin species using the same procedure yield of this material for both the cases varies from 70 to 90 90% could uh, depending upon the product and variation i doesn't so all the materials here because it will elongate the presentation but various library synthesis of this kind of material can be done using the same procedure 
A possible mechanism of this reaction uh, is proposed here. Uh, the mechanism of this reaction uh, are described by varying different kind of literature and the reaction procedure. The first step of the reaction is obviously a novel angle type of reaction, that is the condensation of the aryl amine with the uh, amine system and the glycol system. So getting the uh, double bonded CNPCs, which is an, which is an electrophilic accept, acceptor. And then uh, the amino coumarin pieces uh, uh, adduct with this and to form the C, form the intermediate C. And then it is an intermolecular cyclization reaction and followed by a dehydration reaction of the intermediate D, we are getting the final product. So all this reaction from uh, intermediate A to intermediate D is somehow related to the active acidic sites of the nanoparticles. And so the proton transfer from the site in, is important part for this catalytic reaction. And obviously all these molecules are uh, characterized by different uh, instrumental methods like NMR, Thakin, CCH analysis and representative crystallographic studies of the material also done to prove the uh, structure and identification of this compound. And now come the catalytic part again. Uh, the catalyst is loading is observed. Initially it is found that from 30 mg we are having the catalyst loading from 30 mg to 150 mg and we found that 100 mg catalyst is uh, sufficient, uh, giving sufficient yield in one hour for the standard reaction. Initially it may sound, okay, initially it may sound large, but it can be used for seven times. And we found that the yield is almost maintained to 80% to 70% after using it to 77 time cycles. So it proves the reusability and the cost effectiveness of this catalyst. So in conclusion, I can say this is an one part biologically important compound synthesis, easily available material, magnetically separable magnetic nanoparticles, solvent free condition, reduction of reaction time, good yield. And obviously uh, we have a substrate structure scope, lively synthesis, nanocatalyst is reusable. And finally, I can also say that further work of photophysical activities and biological activities of this compound is going on. I'm not showing data here because that is data is neat the evaluation and experiment mode. Uh, my acknowledgement is my collaborator and teacher, Dr. Professor Animesh Pramanik, University of Calcutta, and Department of Chemistry, Calcutta University, CNN, uh, CRNN for the instrumental support, DST, UDC DST for research funding, Department of Chemistry, Palukat College was supporting me, and Shayan Mukherjee, research scholar, University of uh, Calcutta, who is the co-researcher of this paper also. Thank you for my bearing me. Uh, Shoman, is it uh, published or uh, not published? Yes, sir. The first synthetic part is already published, but the second part is uh, we are working with that part. And the little modification of the structure we have done, and because of the enhanced photophysical activity and biological activity, and uh, what is still going on. Okay. But uh, have you started so, any work? Shoman, in uh, sir, I can't hear you all. Please. Have you started any work at Balugat College? Yes, sir. Some synthetic part are, I have performed in Balugat College, but uh, no more further facilities there for the okay. Yeah. experiments. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Professor Bhattacharya. You, you have measured the efficiency of the catalyst after uh, seven use, use of seven times, seven times use. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Your catalyst seven seven. and efficiency almost uh, remains the same. No, sir, efficiency so decreases, but been... not such. First, initially, the standard reaction we found 80 to 81 percent yield for first first time use, but after seven time use, is yes. yield decreases to 70 percent. Slight decrease, but is still usable. Usable. And have you measured any magnetic property of the catalyst? Yes, sir, it was done by VSM uh, uh, studies. VSM wow. studies was performed for this, but uh, not by me, but by expert of the uh, CRNN. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any more question? Sir, may I out? May I go out? Or yes, 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 please. Thank you very much, uh, Roman. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Our uh, next um, speaker is Dr. Omar Hens, uh, from uh, our assistant professor from Government General Degree College, Ranibad. Yes, I am present here. Okay. Yeah. 
Is the presentation is visible? Yes, yes, yes. A very good afternoon to everybody and good afternoon, my respected SB sir and Professor Dimal sir. The topic of the presentation is NO coordinating sensor selectively gives blue emission in fluoride ion. Myself, Dr. Amor Hens, Department of Chemistry, Government General Degree College, Raniban. First, I want to show the synthesis of the sensor. The sensor is activated as HL. It's very simple procedure to synthesis equimolar reaction of cell cell D8 and two amino fluorine. In methanol, we get NO coordinating bidentate sieve-based ligand. And this is the characteristic 1H NMR spectra of HL. And we also found the crystalline structure of the sensor and the OTEP diagram of the sensor is given below. Now the main objective is that the sensor is sen so any sensitivity towards different anion. It may be spherical, may be planar, may be tetradal. I performed some several spectroscopic study in the presence of different anion with this sensor. First, we perform UVV spectroscopy. In this UVV spectroscopy, the sensor HL show two sharp peaks at 350 and 230 nanometer, which is depicted in figure B right side. In the addition of different anion, there is very little or not change at the lambda max arises 350 or 230 nanometer. But surprisingly, only addition of fluoride anion, the lambda max arises at 350 nanometer, which undergoes hypsochromic shift and appear at 330 nanometer. While the shorter wavelength of the sensor, which appear at 230 nanometer still remain silent in presence of fluoride. So for detailed investigation, I also performed the stepwise addition of fluoride anion in the sensor, which is depicted the figure A left side. And the inside diagram, the mole ratio clearly indicates that the ratio of the fluoride and the sensor HL is 1 is to 1. I also performed the emission spectroscopic study in the presence of different anion. The sensor is very weak emitter and the intensity is not so high, appeared at 500 nanometer. The presence of the various anion, the lambda max as well as the emission intensity, both are remain silent or little change. Only the exceptional behavior appears when we added the fluoride ion into the sensor and it's clearly say by the above image the sensor is colorless under uv lamp but when we put at it fluoride anion it emits blue emissive light that means the fluoride easily easily find out the the sensor easily find out the fluoride anion for the detailed investigation i also perform the stepwise addition of the fluoride anion in the sensor and which is depicted the left side figure A. And we have seen when the ratio becomes to one is to one, there is no further enhancement of the emission intensity take place. That means it reach at a plateau region, which is depicted the inside figure of this PPT. Now, what type of interaction take place with the more electronegative fluoride ion with the sensor I also performed 1H NMR titration spectra, additions of the fluoride ion in different ratio. At the bottom, the absence of fluoride anion, a more desilding peak above 30 ppm arises mainly due to phenolic proton, which is gradually more desilding the addition of fluoride anion and the intensity also diminishes and completely disappears when the ratio becomes to more than 1 is to 1. So from this NMR titration spectroscopy, we conclude that the more electronegative fluoride ion somehow snatch out the phenolic proton from the sensor. And for the detailed investigation of the photophysical UV study as well as the emission study, we also performed 
the S0 optimized state for UVP spectra and S1 optimized state for emission spectra. And the left side HOMO and LOMO for the S0 optimized state, the higher energy gap and the theoretical lambda max appears near about 325 nanometer, which is very good correlate with the lambda max appears from the experimentally of UVBS data in the mixture of fluoride ion and the sensor. As well as when we optim perform the same things for S1 state to establish the emission behavior, theoretically, we saw that the HOMO is somehow higher in energy and the LOMO is somehow lower in energy. And ultimately, the homo-lomo energy gap is decreased. And we find out from the longer wavelength near at 439 nanometer theoretically, which is also very good correlate with the lambda max value appeared from experimentally of emission data, the mixture of fluoride and the sensor. That means from the S2 state and S1 state, DFT and TDDFT is a good correlation with the data appeared from experimentally UVVs as well as the emission spectroscopy. And finally, we also done potential surface energy scan. And this scan clearly indicates that the fluoride and the sensor adapt have two confirmers. One is from A, which is less planar and another is lower energy, more stable form B, which is so in more planar. And the selective bond distance of CO, OH and FH are given in the table at the bottom. And from the bond distance of the adduct from A, which CO bond distance is higher and is related to the more keto form, while and the form B, it becomes smaller. And they will conclude that the proton is transferred from excited state in the presence of fluoride and the structure gives in more planar form. That means we finally conclude that that excited state proton is transformed from inner form to keto form. And ultimately, it prefers the ESI PT mechanism in the presence of more electronegative fluoride ion. And as well as secondly, we conclude that this sensor easily find out the presence of fluoride ion by changing color from colorless to blue emissive light. And I finally, I acknowledge and thanks to, sincerely thanks to my supervisor, Professor Prajol Kishno Rajak, Jadhapur University. I also acknowledge Government General Degree College, Raniwan. I am thankful to the organizing committee of this webinar. I am very much thankful to the convener of the webinar, Shutapa ma'am, and my friend, Shomokanti Mati. And finally, thanks to all the participants for being present. Uh, we don't see any questions in the chat box yet. Uh, let's see. Uh, just uh, wait for a second. Uh, if you no questions, then uh, thank you, Amor, uh, for the nice, nice presentation, though. Okay. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. we'll go to the next uh, next speaker, uh, Dhruva uh, Mondo. Yes, assistant professor from Government General Degree College, Mongol Court. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you uh, see my uh, presentation? Yes, it is coming. Yes. Okay, may I start? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you, sir. So first of all, I want to thank Government General College Keshwari uh, for giving me the opportunity to present my work. So here you can see uh, my um, uh, topic. Topic name is given cause of from anti to phenomenality exchange coupling, a new family of this new phenoxide dicopper to complexes, a comprehensive magnetic structural correlation by theoretical and 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 uh, experimental study. So, first, a brief introduction about my work. Binocular copper complexes having CO2 O2 core play an important role in the active site of large family of metal proteins in biological systems. Not only from the biological point of view, it shows an equal importance from the magnetic point of view. So, in case of dicopper two complexes, uh, you can see each copper contains a half, a half screen. So, there are two possibilities: one is ferromagnetic coupling, other 
another one is anti fermentic coupling now if you consider a blue mu 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 phenox side dicoper two complexes maximum number of blue, uh, this complexes uh, shows the anti fermentic coupling and very there are very little complexes that shows ferromagnetic interactions now if you consider the magnetic exchange interaction that depends on the following factors now the number one is breathing copper oxygen copper angle copper copper distances uh, copper uh, cu o cu cu o cu torsion angle quadrature uh, geometry around the copper ions and copper oxygen bond distances now this is a synthetic scheme for since uh, for the generation of these complexes here you can see this is a tetra and a phenol and amine based ligand and and you can see there are three different substitution r1 r2 and r3 that's why the ligand named as h2l r1 comma r2 comma r3 okay and the ligand substitution are deliberately uh, deliberately choose, chosen here to influence the coordination around the uh, copper center and such strategy appears to be successful as you can see some complexes complex 1 and 2 here complex 1 and 2 shows uh, copper with square pyramidal geometry but complex 3 and 4 and 5 contains copper with square planar geometry okay so here these complexes are synthesized by treating this ligand with copper uh, cupric perchlorate in presence of triethyl amine in methanol solvent okay now you can see this is the uv spectra of these complexes you can see this is the a band around 450 nanometer that is due to phenolic to copper to charge transfer transition and another band you can see around 650 nanometer that is due to d to d transitions and this is the crystal structure of complex 1 here you can see the ligand is methyl 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 here you can see this is methyl this is methyl or nitrogen it is also methyl that's why ligand is methyl 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 tau value is 0.23 so it indicates that it is a destructive square pyramidal geometry and most importantly if you measure the copper copper separation the separation is 2.98 angstrom the copper oxygen copper bond angle is 98.63 degree and if you measure the copper inaxial bond distance that is 2.39 angstrom this is complex 2 here the tau value is 0.35 and 0. 09 so both copper again are square distorted square pyramid geometry here you can see the copper copper separation is 2.99 angstrom and if you measure the copper oxygen copper bond angle that is 297.92 degree and it slightly decreases from the previous complex and if you measure the copper inaxial distance that is 2.46 angstrom uh, due to more steady pressure of the ethyl group the, the copper nitrogen bond distance elongates now this is complex 3 in this complex 3 you can see the geometry is square planar so here you can see the substitution is isopropyl isopropyl and on nitrogen also isopropyl so due to more steric pressure the nitrogen this night to nitrogen n2 and n4 that do not form bond with the copper centers that's why the geometry is square planar and you can if you measure the copper copper separation it is 2.87 so it decreases from the previous one 2.999 here to 2.87 and if you measure the copper oxygen copper bond angle that is 94.39 degree so this is the structure of complex 4 here you can see the ligand is structure vitel methyl isopropyl geometry is square planar copper copper separation is 2.72 angstrom copper oxygen copper bond angle is 86.95 degree this is complex 5 here the ligand is structure vitel structure vitel isopropyl so highest steric pressure here and for that reason copper copper separation 2.63 angstrom and copper oxygen bond angle now it is 83.27 degree and geometry here again square planar this in short the copper oxygen copper bond angle copper copper distance and hinge distortion of the copper oxygen came up in the complex 1 to 5 you can see this is the average cu or cu angle you can see that bond angle decreases from 98.60 degree to 83.27 degree and you can see the copper copper separation decreases from 2.98 angstrom to 2.63 angstrom Uh, all the final complications are seen uh, if you measure the copper oxygen copper torsion angle that is the hinge distortion it is it increases from 25.98 to 46.49 degree now we have done the magnetic study you can see the room temperature this is the allow, around 300 kelvin and the room temperature tight value is given here you can see the for complex 1 it is 0.39 for complex 2 0.49 for complex 3 0.70 for complex 4 0.84 complex 5 0.81 so the, if you consider complex 5 and 5 on the 4 and 5 they they have the almost equal value uh, with the theoretical value for non for two non interacting copper two ions is 0.28 but if you consider complex 1 2 and 3 they are very lower value than the theoretical value that's why at room temperature you, you can see there's 
some amount of anti-inflammatory coupling occurs. Now, what I have done, you have to do, you have to decrease the temperature. If you decrease the temperature, you can see complex one, two, and three that becomes uh, almost kt is equal to zero. So it indicates that this is anti-inflammatory coupling. Now, if you consider complex four and five here, it gradually increases to one. So here, complex four and five shows ferromagnetic coupling. Okay, the ferromagnetic coupling of the complex four also confirmed by field dependence of the magnetization at 1.8 Kelvin. Now, this is the structure and magnetic fit parameters of the complexes one to five. You can see the J value for complex one minus 395 for complex two, minus 259 for complex three, minus 185 for complex four, plus 46, and plus complex five, this 53.2. So gradually the J value increases, and these three complexes shows the anti ferromagnetic coupling, and these two complexes shows the ferromagnetic coupling with the decrease of copper oxygen copper bond angle, uh, with the decrease of copper copper separation. Now, this is the theoretical calculation. We have also done theoretical uh, data. The theoretical value almost co co coincides with the experimental data. And this is the plot of J with the copper oxygen, copper bond angle. And that shows a linear relationship, so it shows a straight line. And here you can see the uh, blue square, that is the experimental data. And the red circle is the theoretical data. And this is the crossover point. The crossover point is 87 degree. So above that 87 degree, all complexes are ferromagnetic. And below that uh, crossover point, all complexes are anti ferromagnetic. Now, this is the J versus copper oxide copper torsion angle with a crossover point of 42 degree. Now, this is the uh, J versus copper copper distance plot. Here you can see the crossover point is 2.7 angstrom. So, above when the distance is below 2.7 angstrom, copper complexes source ferromagnetic coupling. And when it is greater than 2.7 angstrom, source the anti ferromagnetic coupling. Okay, so we have also uh, this is the spin density plot in the in the complex one. You can see 2 dx square minus y square orbital. This is the Almost co planar, and this was a super oxygen interaction in plane P or the bridging of super oxygen. So, this is uh, anti ferromagnetic coupling in complex 5. The two orbitals are almost uh, orthogonal to each other, and they, 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 the diagonal angle is 90 degree, and there is no super exchange via bridging oxygen. So, this work is published in ACS Omega 2019. And here, uh, this is the first time we have measured the crossword angle from anti ferromagnetic to ferromagnetic uh, coupling. And uh, the coordination geometry on the copper atom has been tuned from square pyramidal to square planar. Variation of spin coupling constant from huge anti ferromagnetic to ferromagnetic. And linear relationship coupling of J with this angle. Copper, copper, copper oxygen, copper oxygen torsion angle, and copper, copper separation. Variation of copper oxygen bond angle that is done from 98.6 to 83.3 degree with a cost per point 87 degree. Variation of copper oxygen, copper oxygen torsion angle varies from 26 to 46 degree with a cost per point 42 degree. And copper, copper separation varies from 2.98 to 2.63 angstrom with cost per point 2.77 on angstrom. Complex 5 has the lowest copper, copper separation, lowest copper oxygen, copper bond angle, and large ferromagnetic interaction among the reported complexes. Finally, I want to acknowledge my uh, guide, Professor Muktimal Choudhury, and my collaborators. Thank you. Sir? Uh, yes. Any questions? OK, Dupajiti, thank you. I, I think we don't see any uh, question in the uh, chat box. OK, sir. Dr. Mondal, have you published this article? Yes, I have published in ACS Omega Journal, 2019. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Uh, any more question? Okay. If no more question, then we'll uh, move on to the next speaker. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Subhash. Sorry. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Shayan. Shayan Nita. Shayan Nita. Shayan Nita Panda. Ah, yes, right. I am present. Assistant oh. Professor from Shohid Matongini Hajra Government College for Women's College. Women's College. Yes. Okay. Sir, is this visible? Uh, yes, uh, start. Okay, sir. A very warm greetings to all the academicians and faculty members. Myself, Shayanita Panja, Assistant Professor in Chemistry, Shait Matangiri Hajra Government College for Women, West Bengal. And this presentation talks about 
implementation of green chemistry to obstruct pollution it's a review article we all know about bhopal gas tragedy during december 2nd and december 3rd in the year 1984 methyl isocyanate spilled out from union carbide india limited which is a pesticide factory and turned the city of bhopal into a colossal gas chamber it was india's first major industrial disaster at least 30 tons of methyl isocyanate gas killed more than 15000 people and maimed around 50000 you know but the defects remain very high in bhopal gas survivors even 36 years after disaster in the year 1969 user factory was made to produce savin using methyl isocyanate as an intermediate savin is an insecticide and still widely used in gardens and landscapes savin can also be prepared from alpha naphthol using phosgene which is also toxic but not as toxic as methyl isocyanate After this Bhopal transformation, the people all over the world began to practice chemistry in an alternative manner, so that it creates a surrounding. Out of that pathway, green chemistry came out. The main motive of which is to prevent pollution, sustaining the earth. This is also called as mineing by design chemistry. Now, what is green chemistry? Green chemistry is the utilization of a set of principles that reduces or eliminates the use or generation of hazardous substances in the design, manufacturing, and application of chemical products to human health and the environment. And this has been said by Paul Anastas, and he is also known as the father of green chemistry. Whereas environmental chemistry focuses on the effects of polluting chemicals on nature. Green chemistry focuses on technological approaches to prevent pollution and reducing consumption of non-renewable resources. Actually, green chemistry talks about waste minimization, use of catalysts, non-toxic reagents, renewable resources, improved atom economy, as well as solvent-free or recyclable solvent system. Now, laboratory applications. Lysine test or sodium fusion test is used in laboratory for qualitative detection of special elements in organic compounds. Very recently, an alternative green procedure has been exhibited through fusion with zinc and sodium carbonate mixture instead of metallic sodium, and this experiment totally removes the risk of explosion and fire hazard, which are often take place while we carrying out the same experiment using metallic sodium. This is a very interesting reaction. Conventional benzene condensation of benzene dehyde to benzene with extremely toxic poisonous reagent potassium cyanide. Nowadays, it is done by using a very innocuous compound, vitamin B1, thiamine hydrochloride. And this reaction is very simple, but uh, the temperature has to be properly maintained for this particular reaction. Now, conventional synthesis of adipic acid, where cyclohexanol or cyclohexanone reacts with fuming nitric acid, which yields adipic acid. But here, nitrogen dioxide is evolved, which has several harmful effects on nature as well as human health. Royal Noyri suggested this green pathway to synthesize adipic acid from cyclohexin using 30% hydrogen peroxide and sodium tungstate catalyst. Now the role of catalyst. Catalysts can be divided into two main types: homogeneous and heterogeneous catalyst. Apart from this, there exists nano catalyst, which acts as bridge in between them. They have high surface area, so they have got increased contact between reagents and catalyst, and easily can be separated from reaction medium. Actually, nano catalyst offers the advantages of both the homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysts. We all know about reduction of nitrobenzene to aniline using tin and concentrated HCl, and huge amount of byproducts like a tin hydroxide is formed here. Uh, Professor B. C. Ranu developed an elegant green alternative of this reduction procedure using iron nanoparticles, and here is no formation of huge amount of byproducts like tin hydroxide. Now, industrial application. Supercritical carbon dioxide fluid is a fluid is a versatile green solvent which has low viscosity and no surface tension. It has the unique ability to diffuse like gas through solids, and it is non-toxic, non-flammable, and very cheap. Now, use of supercritical carbon dioxide for eco-friendly dry cleaning. 
Most of the dry cleaners use solvent per chloroethylene in dry cleaning process, which is carcinogenic, and it has been decomposed into chlorine radical in presence of sunlight and responsible for depleting ozone layer. To solve this problem, Joseph D. Simon synthesized micelle, which is made up of liquid carbon dioxide and a surfactant for cleaning garments. The cleaning machines nowadays have been produced utilizing this procedure. Another industrial application is construction of building with green technology. Green buildings use a variety of eco-friendly techniques to reduce their influence on the environment. Use of passive solar design, natural ventilation, green roofing technology, etc. not only benefits the environment, but also we can produce uh, economically attractive buildings. Here is some advantages of green roofing technology, such as it reduce heating, create a healthy atmosphere, space utilization, etc. One of the best example of green technology is use of solar cell, where the solar is uh, converts into uh, electrical energy, and uh, here less consumption of fossil fuel occurs, which reduce pollution and uh, greenhouse gas emission. Now at last, but not the least, the use of bioplastics. Such eco-friendly biodegradable thermoplastic polyester is polylactic acid, which can be synthesized from green and renewable resources like corn, sugarcane, rice, wheat, sweet potatoes, etc. Polylactic acid has several applications uh, in the field of uh, bio in the field of biomedical applications uh, such as bone fixation tissue engineering etc and in also in a uh, food packaging like food wrapping container drinking cup etc and other structural applications such as uh, civil structures furnitures automobiles etc this is the pathway of synthesis of polylactic acid from corn by ring opening polymerization of lactide which is a cyclic dimer of lactic acid in US, corn is the cheapest starch rich and most widely available annually renewable resource from which lactic acid is produced. At present, many countries like uh, Switzerland, China and Korea are taking initiative in the production of polylactic acid. This is the constructive graphical representation of global bioplastic packaging uh, market uplifting from uh, 2015 to 2025. Now the conclusion, green chemistry is not a brand new branch of science, it's a brand new approach to prevent pollution and reducing consumption of non-renewable resources. The practice of green chemistry means doing clean chemistry and the biggest challenge of green chemistry is to use its rules in practice. The book one must read to learn chemistry is a book of nature and this has been said by Swami Vivekananda. And we have to think green and leave a big positive footprint to save the earth. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, um, Antana, uh, yes, sir, uh, right, Shayanita. So, but there's a question, so I think there's a textbook question. Uh, so, would you like to answer that? Yes, sir. Uh, then, there, there's a question in the chat box. Chat box, okay, uh, sir. what are the 12 principles of green chemistry? Yes, sir. So, how do you answer that? Actually, the 12 principles are already. We all of we all are known about that, and these right. are actually. I am just summarize these twelve principles, which are really we have to. Um, no, no, we, have, we, don't have we have to, to use the less it's hazardous less stocks. Uh, yes, sir. You don't have to answer. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, uh, but I, I just uh, my, my, I have a comment to, to make. See, green chemistry, uh, electro organic synthesis has yes. lot to do with green chemistry. Yes. But you have overlooked any example from that area, though. Sir, please repeat this one. Electro organic synthesis. Yes, sir. Electro organic synthesis. It's a, it's a very good branch for green chemistry. Okay, there are sir. plenty of examples where just by doing electrochemistry, you can make organic synthesis green. Um, one of the examples is that nitrogen can be reduced to aniline by yes, electrochemically. Sir. By electrochemically. Okay, any case, okay. but any case, you have provoked the discussion. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, uh, sir. Okay, we will go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, next speaker okay, is Pooja Rani. Yes, Pooja Rani Kuri.
Research Scholar of Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Okay, I'm. I'm going to present my screen. Anita, please uh, uh, leave. Stop your presentation. Is my screen visible? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, no, no, not yet, not yet, not yet. Uh, okay, please let me know. I've already uh, shared the screen. Pujarani, please um, open your PPT. Then again, do present now. Okay. Is my screen visible now? Not yet. Yes. Uh, it's probably going to be okay. Going to be visible. Uh, yes, now it's okay. It's visible. Yes, yes. Okay. Let's okay. Start. Fine. Let's start. Uh, my topic is aptama modified nanomaterials and their biosensing applications. I'm a research scholar from IIT Guwahati. Let's begin with the introduction. Well, what is a biosensor? A biosensor is a device used for the detection of an analyte. Now, this biosensor is composed of two very important elements. One is the biological recognition molecule, also called as the bioreceptor. Now, the function of this bioreceptor is to interact with the analyte of interest and thereby generate a biochemical signal. This biochemical signal is converted into a measurable signal by the transduction element. The transduction element is another important component of biosensor. This bioreceptor could be uh, of any nature. It could be antibody, it could be enzyme, or it could be DNA or RNA sequences or living cells or tissues. Moving on to what an aptamer is. An aptamer is a single-stranded DNA or RNA nucleotide sequence, usually varies from 18 to uh, 50 nucleotide sequences. It has the capability to assume three-dimensional conformation structure by the virtue of which it can interact with specific targets. And thereby, it can be used for many applications, whether from diagnostic point of view or, uh, uh, or uh, in therapy. Uh, we know a similar molecule uh, that has binding function, that is antibody, which is quite popular in biosensor technology and in therapeutic uh, field. Uh, but aptamers uh, have some advantages over antibodies. For example, aptamers are generated by an in vitro technique called as systemic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment. Once an aptamer for a specific target is obtained, it can be synthesized again and again chemically in a reproducible manner unlike antibody. Also, aptamers are highly stable uh, as compared to antibody, and they are also specific and good enough as antibody themselves. Aptamers, however, can be generated for any target molecule, whether immunogenic or non-immunogenic. Aptamers are therefore called as chemical antibodies and provide potential uh, alternatives to be used instead of antibodies wherever applicable. Application of aptamers uh, range from food inspection, bioimaging, hazard detection, disease diagnost di diagnostics, or drug delivery. Now, uh, these aptamers and nanoparticles can be used in conjunction in biosensor technology for detection principles. Properties of nanomaterials include a large surface to volume ratio. Metal nanoparticles have unique light scattering properties and exhibit plasmon resonance. Uh, and nanoparticles have unique chemical and physical properties which can be exploited in detection principles. Uh, there are many aptamer nanoparticle conjugates that have been developed in literature for biosensing uh, for a variety of targets right from small molecules to protein targets of, or a disease biomarker. Of note, out of these aptamer nanoparticle conjugates, uh, gold nanoparticle has been exploited the most uh, that is, has been uh, conjugated with aptamer the most and employed for biosensing. 
here i have taken a case study uh, for uh, uh, aptamer functionalized gold nanoparticle for high sensitively uh, sensitive detection of melamine in milk samples now melamine is an organic compound that is commonly found uh, uh, in the form of nitrogen rich white crystals and is synthesized from urea uh, but uh, it is illegally added or uh, it is used as an adulterant in food animal feed and even milk uh, to increase protein content and high dosage of melamine uh, will result in severe kidney damage to both humans and animals therefore its detection is uh, important in this case study gold nanoparticles was prepared uh, with a uniform diameter of 13 nanometers uh, and uh, unfunctionalized gold nanoparticles were found to be stable in solution with a wine red coloration and uh, a typical absorption peak of 520 nanometers uh, in this study gold nanoparticles were coated with the single stranded aptamer now this aptamer was specific for melamine molecule uh, uh, this attachment or conjugation of aptamer uh, and the gold nanoparticles was done by means of a coordination bond. The aptamer was functionalized with uh, amino group at the five terminal position and the uh, amino groups of aptamers offer a, a pair of electrons that do not participate in bonding. And correspondingly, gold atom in gold nanoparticles provide an empty orbital bonding. Therefore, the aptamers can be absorbed onto the surface of gold nanoparticles through coordination bond. Uh, but uh, this coordination bond is relatively weak and this is the principle of detection utilized here because when a competitive target that is melanine which is more specific to the antibody and uh, the strength of interaction is uh, stronger than the mere uh, covalent uh, coordination bonding the aptamer are dislodged uh, from the gold nanoparticle surface uh, which causes gold nanoparticle to aggregate and shift in absorbance from 520 to 650. Uh, this is a, a study where in solution phase uh, a spiked milk was used that is uh, milk was obtained and a known concentration of melamine were added and uh, and the experiment was carried out now gold nanoparticle uh, uh, absorbed uh, with with the aptamer when uh, present when sensed the presence of melamine uh, the interaction between the aptamer and melamine took place and dislodged and dislodgement took place of the aptamer. Now this caused a uh, shifting of the absorbance from 520 to 650. Uh, in, in order to quant quantitatively detect this, of course, UV visible spectroscopy was used uh, and the absorption ratio of A650 to A520 profile was used to determine sensitivity. Uh, this study showed that uh, on uh, incre with increase in concentration of melamine, uh, uh, the, the absorbance at 520 nanometer decreased and a new absorption peak around 640 nanometer appeared. Uh, this study is just an example among many uh, that gold nanoparticles can be used uh, themselves as a transduction element of the biosensor when conjugated with the uh, sense specificity determining component that is an aptamer. Uh, these are few of the important references. Thank you for your kind attention. What is the lambda max absorption of the autumn gold nanoparticles when it is functionalized to it after Sir, so it is uh, 520 nanometers. 520 nanometer. Gold nanoparticles. Sir, and if sir it is gold nanoparticle, uh, and to avoid their aggregation, uh, aptamer was yes, used. Yes, yes, functionalized with aptamer. And yes. the lambda max absorption remains at 520 nanometer. Okay? Yes. And when it is melanine is added, then mm. it is shifted to 650 uh, nanometers. 650 nanometers. Are they fluorescent or not? Yes, they are visually uh, they are visually uh, changes color from wine red to bluish color. No, because you have uh, used colorimetric analysis. Right? Yes, colorimetric analysis. Okay. okay, that means change in a more red region. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, okay, Puja, there there are no more questions. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Our next speaker is Shuparno Devnath, PG student okay. uh, from Bidhan Nagar College. Okay. okay.
It takes time, it seems. The PowerPoint is not, ah, okay, now it's good. Is there a problem? I think ready, ready yet or not ready? Important to our voice on a china. Suporno? Unmute Koro. Am I audible now? Yes, I am audible. Your presentation is also gone. It isn't gone. So please open your PowerPoint and then present now. Immediately, very fast. Is it visible, sir? No. No, no. If, if, if you again open your PowerPoint, then present now. Do present now. Yes. Is it visible? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I am a student of Bidanagar College Chemistry Department. This is my educational drugs and therapies for the treatment of COVID-19. There are some key points. Medicines are undergoing investigations to clinical trials of COVID-19, but at this time none are licensed. The random COVID-19 therapy trial recovery commenced in March 2020 includes patients with clinically suspected or laboratory confirmed COVID-19 in hospital. Treatments currently included in this trial are lopinavir, ritonavir, corticosteroids, azithromycin, tocilizumab, and convalescent plasma. Although many trials are undergoing, the number of patients involved are small and many of them of the studies of limitations. Pharmacists should consider how these medicines can impact patients with existing conditions or who are on other medicines. Pharmacists should be aware that the sites being used in clinical trials may be different from the licensed sites of these medicines. Dexamethasone is the first drug to be shown to improve survival in COVID-19. Medicines currently being first tracked through clinical trials. There are some major investigational drugs. These are Remdesivir, Fabipiravir, Hydroxychloroquine Sulfate, Lopinavir, Corticosteroids, Tocilizumab, Nitazoxanide, Interferons, etc. There are also some agents under investigation for severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. These are Arbidol, which is an antiviral used in Russia and China for influenza. Bevacizumab, which is a recombinant humanized monoclonal which is an HIV-1 protease inhibitor. Also, some other agents like Galidesivir. Galidesivir is a nucleoside RNA polymerase inhibitor. Nelfin, which is an HIV-1 protease inhibitor. Niclosamide, which is an anti drug. Sophosbuvir, which is an antiviral used to treat hepatitis C and vitamin C. Here's a simple process of viral RNA replication. Step 1. 
Spike protein on the surface of SARS-CoV-2 uses the angiotensin converting enzyme to gain entry to the host cell, followed by releasing its RNA. Step 3, RNA is translated into polypeptides. Step 4, some polypeptides form RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is needed to make more RNA. Step 5, other polypeptides are cleaved by proteases to produce viral proteins. Step 6, Proteins and RNA are assembled into a new virion. And finally, new virion is released from the host cell. Remdesivir. Mechanism of action. Remdesivir is an adenosine analog that incorporates into nascent viral RNA chain and results in premature termination preventing viral replication. Preclinical and clinical trials of remdesivir drug. The study demonstrated that both remdesivir and chloroquine potentially infection at low micromolar concentration and showed high selectivity in death. The trial compares use of remdesivir 200 mg administered in daily on day 1 followed by 100 mg once daily thereafter duration of the hospitalization up to a 10 day total course. Another that inhibits viral RNA polymerase preventing virus from replication. Favipiravir is currently on licensed in Japan for influenza. There's an interest to examine whether existing antiviral medicines, particularly their mechanism of action, would be effective in treating coronaviruses. This is the mechanism of action of favipiravir. Another drug is hydroxychloroquine sulfate. Hydroxychloroquine is thought to block viral infection by increasing endosomal pH required for cell fusion, therefore preventing virion fusion. At present, in vitro studies show activity with hydroxychloroquine having higher potency against coronavirus in comparison to chloroquine. Clinical trials and studies. One small study of 36 patients conducted in France reported that treated with hydroxychloroquine alone in combination with COVID-19 treatment. Another drug is lopinavir. Lopinavir and ritonavir inhibit protease and enzyme HIV and coronavirus is used to replicate. Lopinavir showed antiviral activity against SARS. However, when combined with ribavirin, concentration of lopinavir increased. Clinic studies. A cohort study by Young et al. used lopinavir and ritonavir at different doses to understand the clinical course in 18 patients in Singapore. Out of these 18 patients, 5 were treated with lopinavir and ritonavir twice daily which is half the usual course. Of these patients, the clinical condition of two deteriorated. Corticosteroids. This is a class of steroid hormones. Corticosteroids are a range of chemically related compounds that can be classified according to their glucocorticoid or mineralocorticoid effects. Corticoids have a good effect on anti-inflammatory effects the main anti-inflammatory effect of glucocorticoids is to inhibit necro-inflammatory genes. Treatment of COVID-19 with corticosteroids and the associated immune suppression has been shown to cause higher rates of bacterial infection and other complications. Interferons are an important category of proteins based on therapeutics or biologics. They are heterogeneous group of cytokines with complex biological function characteristics. Conclusions. COVID-19 pandemic that has caused about 0.79 million deaths in August worldwide. All this after sunrise to severe several of the main investigational drugs being used in the treatment of COVID-19. There are no licensed medications for the treatment of the Some evidence indicates that remdesivir could be a promising COVID-19, but data is limited and further studies warranted. All the facts
Ritavir is not currently included in any of the UK trials for COVID-19. It has potential to be advantageous as it is a broad spectrum antiviral. This limited information on the use of triple therapy of lopinavir ritonavir combined with ribavirin in treating COVID-19. Until further research is carried out, evidence of the significance of the combination of these drugs remains inconclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Suparno? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, we don't see any questions in the chat box. Hello. Hello, Suparno? We don't see any uh, questions in the chat box, so we'll, we'll move on to the next speaker. Next speaker okay, is Thank you. Ms. Ms. Tamogni Manna. Am I audible? Yes. And good afternoon, everyone. And today, the but, uh, topic of my article is chemical yes, changes. Chemical changes in human brain during exercise. And myself, Tomogni Manna, researcher of Department of Human Physiology, Badwan University. Exercise stimulates various brain chemicals that may leave a person feeling happier and more relaxed. The human brain is made up of cells called neurons, which are about 100 billion that transmit chemical signals or neurotransmitters. What are neurotransmitters? A neurotransmitter is a chemical substance which is released at the end of a nerve by the arrival of a nerve impulse. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that transmit a message from one nerve cell across a synapse to a target cell. Two types of neurotransmitters in particular called endorphins and serotonin are responsible mainly for why one feels so good during exercise. Any endurance activity from a vigorous sprint triathlon or a trot on the treadmill to a long walk with paid dog, our brain releases endorphins, the neurotransmitters responsible for what some call the runner's high. It's that feel-good sensation one gets after a bout of aerobic exercise. Endorphin and serotonin. Endorphins are the body's internal painkiller. So instead of feeling pain, endorphins leave one feeling pleasure. Serotonin is a mood-boosting neurotransmitter and is known as the happy chemical because it too makes us feel good. But unlike endorphins, which initially block pain to produce pleasure, serotonin promotes pleasure itself. In addition to antidepressant and anxiolytic properties, 5-HT system has also been linked to cognitive function. The brain benefits of exercise. Actually, exercise increases the production of neurochemicals that promote brain cell repair, improves memory, lengthens attention span, boosts decision-making skills, prompts growth of nerve cells and blood vessels, and improves multitasking and planning. Regions of brain and exercise. Brain regions like amygdala and prefrontal cortex are mainly responsible to regulate the stress response. Endocannabinoids are endogenous lipid-based retrograde neurotransmitter that binds to cannabinoid receptors and are expressed throughout the central nervous system and is mainly described as don't worry, be happy chemicals. Amygdala and prefrontal cortex are rich in receptors for endocannabinoids. When endocannabinoid molecules lock into these receptors, they reduce anxiety and induce a state of containment. A special type of neurotransmitter, endocannabinoids, can get attached with the receptor of these areas and rise dopamine level in the brain's reward system to reduce anxiety. Brain regions and exercise. Actually, weightlifting is mainly controlled by prefrontal cortex of brain, which is also related to complex thinking, reasoning, multitasking, problem solving. And during yoga, frontal lobe and insula get activated. And it also integrates thoughts and emotions. And in case of fear and anxiety, amygdala regulates it. 
and exercise with high intensity intervals are regulated mainly by hypothalamus which also regulate our appetite and sport skills is mainly regulated by prefrontal cortex basal ganglia and which is also helps in the regulation of attention switching between task and inhibition and parietal lobe is related to visual spatial processing and cerebellum is related to our attention and aerobic exercise is mainly controlled by hippocampus of our brain which is also helps in the control of our memory the chemical changes during exercise during acute exercise bdnf or brain derived neurotropic factor and endogenous neuropeptide activates the trkb that is tropomyosin receptor kinase b the neurotropins which activate trkb are bdnf neurotropin 4 that is nt4 also known as nt4 or 5 and neurotropin 3 the activation of trkb receptors by neurotropin binding may leads to the activation of signal cascades exercise and euphoria euphoria is a strong feeling of happiness exercise is known to affect dopamine signaling in the nucleus accumbens producing euphoria as a result through increased biosynthesis of three particular neurochemicals that is anandamide phenethylamine and beta endorphin anandamide during aerobic exercise causes an increase in plasma anandamide level where the magnitude of this increase is highest at moderate exercise intensity that is exercising at 70 to 80% of maximum heart rate increase in plasma anandamide levels are associated with psychoactive effects because anandamide is able to cross the blood brain barrier and act within the central nervous system now beta endorphin elevated beta endorphin concentration induced by exercise have been related to several psychological and physiological changes inducing mood state changes and exercise induced euphoria and phenethylamine is a trace amine and amphetamine analog now these are the chemical structure of this precious neurochemicals which get elevated during our exercise BDNF a protein called brain derived neurotropic factor also promotes cognitive health in areas such as memory learning and depressive illness BDNF's main role is to promote the survival and growth of neurons and to ensure the proper transmission of chemical messages between brain cells if neurons die chemical signals are interrupted and cognitive functioning declines the presence of BDNF strengthens neurons ensuring their survivability which means message signaling continues to move along nicely sustaining positive mood keeping memory intact and learning better exercise triggers the production of bdnf protein now this is the signaling pathway it is during exercise the irisin get activated is a type of a hormone and which stimulate the strat3 signaling pathway and which in turn give rises to the bdnf and which ultimately cause the neuroplasticity that is increase in the number of neurons in our brain and makes us feel the feeling of good feeling that is the euphoria the feeling of happiness and the molecules affecting brain during exercise beta lipotropin beta lipotropin is a 90 amino acid polypeptide that is the carboxy terminal fragment of pomc beta lipotropin uh, stimulates the melanocytes to produce melanin now ketones runner's brain contain high levels of ketones which are the byproduct of the breakdown of fat during strenuous exercise the body relies in part on fat for fuel and winds up creating ketones some of which are tiny enough to cross the blood brain barrier the brain uses these ketones for fuel brain blood sugar level grow low irisin was responsible for exercise in those Don't don't read out. Don't read out. In Irisin increase the level of crucial protein, maintaining healthy neurons and creating new ones. Now the monoamine neurotransmitter. These are known to be modulated by exercise through G protein coupled receptors. There is dopamine, endocannabinoids, and opioids. can indirectly activate dopamine cells 
in the ventral tegmental area of our brain we know that exercise can be addictive and that other substances and behaviors that are addictive have increased dopamine release in vta target regions as a common property it has been seen in rats in wheel running cause dopamine release in their nucleus accumbens and vta target regions rat also show some signs of exercise addiction now norepinephrine in addition to stress resistance norepinephrine is also participate in commanding and consolidation and retrieval of memory especially emotional memory serotonin boost our mood overall sense of well being appetite and sleep cycles which is often negatively affected by depression now exercise and hippocampal neurogenesis hippocampal neurogenesis as a function of exercise has been extensively demonstrated and replicated to test this rodents were injected with some of me some of me your time is over now and actually Hello. our brain loves exercise and these are the Hello. following cause some of me your time is over now and athlete's brain has been found to be much superior than our normal human beings brain due to their training effect and it has been seen that in case of black belt karate experts and divers their white matter is higher than the gray matter and their brain size is also larger than normal people now thank you all every ending is just really a new beginning stay safe and healthy and do some exercise to keep yourself and your brain healthy thank you well uh, there are no questions in the chat box so we'll go to the next speaker uh, next speaker is uh, hello next next speaker is uh, homo shinara tomogni please stop your presentation hello Hello. 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 We can hear you. We can hear you. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Can I present now? You start now, but 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 where is your presentation? Is not ready yet. Your presentation is not ready yet. You can show the video. Yes, this is visible. Yes, visible, visible. So much in what a visible your presentation. Can I start now? Yes, sir. You start, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, my topic is the case study of natural products for against COVID-19. Nowadays, natural products are not only important for safety, but also for the quality of the product and the quality of the product. Now, we will use the content of the study to discuss the introduction, transforming the inoculation replication, pathogenesis of COVID. Methodologies finding is the discussion research of drug agents for the nineteen possible anti seven nineteen natural products that AIP to inhibit CRS two inhibitors and still plus two inhibitors limitation and this one and this one. Now this is the extra. The real injection play an important role in human disease. And this is also the advent of globalization and state of travel as understood. They are invented as a city of issue in preserving the public health. Recent to the former of the city of Nisha is the issue of developing effective anti-hydral agents at the early age of children that have been developed. The natural process has always played a crucial role in just development against the very issue. This is a focus on the those material products that show the promising results against the foreign animals. This is a very interesting. The various infections are starting to consider as the patients to establish health issues. How this can be defined as the top microscopic non-living agents responsible for several human illnesses, namely composed of the RNA and DNA strands. 
Welcome to COVID-19 Easy, Google Daily, first by the federal acid respiratory treatment. Start coding to is a human strain of the coronavirus Google family, also known as the coronavirus, a large group of single stem inhalation, the RNA virus, which uses the both mammals, reptiles, as their host, including bats and plants. The start coding to a fast group detected in Wuhan, China, in December 2019, and declared a pandemic on March 13, 2020, 15 days after each transition, a pandemic like COVID-19 has infected the high flag 71,689 people. Of course, the world is 23,493 confirmed cases. Coronavirus, enterovirus, and hepatitis B influenza virus and HIV, which is the best of the crisis, could be the same in the high age of the first seven days. But so the emerging the development of safety, chemotherapy, safety, coding, and the The first person to inoculation and replication. The first person to the genomic sequence embedded for inoculation of the main proteins and internally involved in inoculation and replication processes. Fortunately, the genomic sequence closely resembles the SARS CoV 1, 79, and 5% and 110 coronavirus, which is only contagious, that 96%. The genomic data also demonstrates that SARS CoV 2 inoculation and virial replication in human hosts occur mainly through three major proteins and enzymes. These proteins are the Protein-like proteins, the ACE2, and spike proteins, CMP, RSS2, and the three cyanotectin-like proteins, the CMP, and so on. This similarity, the first protein 1 and first protein 2 can start as the short cut in special treatment development for protein algae, as well as the immunized system for coronavirus infection. As a great deal of the research has already been conducted based on the coronavirus system. Like that. Next, the pathogenesis of COVID-19. CLT is a thought that COVID-19 and first and mild pathogenesis is related to SARS and MARS-CoV-2 outbreak to change through the... And these COVID-19 are epidemic in the human population, causing the 15 to 30 percent of respiratory tract infection each year. In this context, COVID-19 has caused a more severe disease in the elderly gender Neuronas and adults with underlying illness with a great incidence of lower respiratory tract infections in these populations. The end COVID 19 has been found to attack all types of people, especially the elderly patients having diabetes, hypertension, chronic infection, and chronic bronchitis, and Parkinson's disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. In this semester, a class was conducted in the following gallery that coordinates the science, created the midline sources of oil in the time in general. The few words of the coronavirus of the art is a natural product, learning gap, and medicinal plants, hydrochemical alkaloids, no salts, the coronavirus, saponin, sarcis, montalcin, dietitin, sexual dietitin, sarcitin, sarcin oil, saponin, 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 polyphenol, microbial metabolites, herbal gas, food extracts, and synthetic derivatives of natural products. That information gets the input that the studies involving the food effects has come out to a preparation of plants, microorganism, or marine origins of skin against COVID. Studies related to derivatives of natural products or chemicals or biochemicals acting against the pollen. Studies to the natural products inside the synthetic derivative acting against the pollen. Expression criteria included. Data distribution of the characters of the content that do not need to Reports from the antiviral activities of natural products of their derivative agents are that in this person and the studies that involve in synthetic sustainability. Findings and discussion. Literature survey shows that the there is a 36 article where the patient in this this is the latest one. This is the alkaloid, the flavonoid, and this is the steroid, no size, and the ligaments and medicines. This is the research that against the protein agent. In earlier, March 
20 the anti malarial hydroxychloroquine and or protein in this or in the activity against the fast current in small genotype state so hydroxychloroquine and anti malarial think that the therapy is same and alkaloid extracts of the dark of the and symptoma is why the a for anti malarial Next, another drug to be in the application of COVID-19 system is the RNA therapy. It acts as the RNA polymerase inhibitor. The immunity of the RNA dependent or RNA polymerase is strategic is the highest system to develop the high safety and reducing the damage to the host cell. Next, the attention of hypertension and death in the eye of pandemic may be a high risk of COVID-19 and hydroxychloroquine and protein in silico efficient cases in the it is the immunity the fight for the among those drugs it can be emphasized in that mentally reduce the patient with the binding energy to fight for them to clean to the body to start to flow it is the so your time is over anti-coding so your time is over okay it is the immunity that the NPR is the key to the core in the Next limitation, this is a change that most of the articles of hydrotherapy for herbal functions which are studied are based on the traditional use of folk medicine in different cultures. The chemistry of identifying the authority of plant source is part of the taxonomy and its major components being the biomass. And pharmacology change states that the inhibitors and inhibitors are the Next conclusion, in the case of the data global challenges, we have tried in the for COVID-19 treatment that can be safely produced in the early stage. Next, we saw that the natural product holds a greater promise to drug development agents for COVID-19 and require to greater attention to the agents that have already been forced to be extremely important as to be the agents who will explain for COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the presentation, uh, but we don't have time to uh, have questions, okay? Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, okay. We'll uh, move on to the next one. Next speaker is uh, Shubhajit. Shubhajit, are you ready? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm ready. Okay. Go ahead. Is it visible now? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, uh, myself, uh, Subhajit, myself, Subhajit Kundu. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes, Thank, yes. You. Thank you. Myself Subhajit from uh, Department of Chemical Technology, University of Calcutta, and I have a background of applied chemistry. And my topic is uh, developments of carbon aerogenous advancement characterization and applications. This is not a working paper. This is one kind of review paper. And I have uh, published uh, this uh, book chapter in uh, Material Research Foundation recently, uh, published by Material Research Foundation uh, USA. And what is uh, now, first of all, what is aerogel? Now, aerogel is a pura solid material derived from gel in which the liquid is replaced by gas now what is the uh, aerogel and what is the different uh, methods of preparation of this kind of aerogel and nowadays uh, not nowadays but over one or two decades soil gel technology um, has become a very pro prominent uh, technology in uh, the point of view from industry because uh, it is uh, it requires uh, very much low energy consumption and so it is very much uh, cost effective now uh, carbon aerogel uh, what is carbon aerogel a carbon based aerogel having a 3d micro and mesoporous network structure interconnected uh, by nano sized primary particles which have tremendous high surface area which uh, uh, boost up its absorption application and now uh, the, there are lots of researchers already have uh, worked uh, in the, this uh, kind of carbon aerogel field first of all in 1932 samuel kistler has uh, developed first uh, this uh, carbon aerogel phenomena now there are uh, due to its uh, very much uh, variety of properties carbon aerogels can be uh, 
uh, can be cat categorized in different forms that is low flexible super flexible what is low flexible carbon erosion now here the dimension of the pores are generally 100 to 100 uh, 10 micrometer and uh, thickness is about 15 to 20 uh, uh, micrometer the structure of this type of aerogel is greatly dependent on the external compression on the aerogel what is super flexible aerogel now this kind of uh, hair uh, there are some large oval shaped and small round shaped pores are observed and up to 10 percent compression of the change is allowed in the super flexible carbon aerogel what is carbon nanotube now carbon um, nanotube the structure of these uh, types of carbon aerogel is largely dependent on the source of carbon and the alcohols and ketones used in the uh, process and and it has uh, now it is very much ap applications graphene ox graphene nano aerogel and this is uh, it's a uh, aerogel derived from graphene oxide it has a, a, a huge applications in the sensor field nowadays what is nano diamond uh, nano diamond aerogel nano diamond aerogels have has unique property of tunable optical index of refraction having the range um, uh, just like from 1 to 25 and there are as so nowadays nickel platinum palladium etc doped carbon aerogel has also been prepared this is a some different synthesis routes of carbon aerogels uh, the first of uh, first one is carbon uh, graphene uh, aerogel preparation and next one is silica cnt that is carbon nanotube uh, hybrid aerogels preparation and the basic principle is the sol gel root and uh, sol gel root and it is and in sol gel root the surface area can be increased a huge amount which has uh, a tremendous uh, uh, capacity to in the application of uh, catalyst adsorption etc and this is uh, some rf that is a resorcional uh, formaldehyde carbon aerogels and here uh, I can mention one thing that is a difference between aerogel and zero gel uh, zero gel is not uh, it is aerogel according to IUPAC zero gels are formed by the removal of all swelling agents from a gel and aerogels according to IPSC the definition of aerogels is the aerogels are a gel composed of a microporous solid in which the dispersed phases gas now the different properties of carbon aerogel first one is bulk density and porosity the bulk density or relative porosity is an indication of the handling properties of the carbon aerogel material and the smaller the salt particles the lower will be the density which facilitates good mechanical properties which i am coming later on what is the backbone density it is defined as the helium uh, um, the amount of helium required to fill the accessible pore volumes per mass and in an activate in an unactivated state generally the value of uh, this density is around 1.4 gram per semi cube and this is the uh, equation uh, from which the backbone density can be calculated and it is also related to the top tier city which affects the transport properties of carbon aerogel and this is the pore connectivity which is uh, or, um, basically Determined from the uh, pore distribution, the uh, pore size distribution from the uh, PS, uh, PGSR and NMR spectroscopy can be used. Pore size, and this is a uh, some correlation from we can uh, determine the pore size of the carbon aerogel. This is a thermal properties, and th here thermal properties the uh, pyrolysis temperature is uh, most important in the industrial field. Uh, here, this is a e equation that is a uh, total um, uh, thermal capacity this is a lambda g is the thermal conductivity of gas lambda s is for solid lambda e occurred by the electrons and lambda r is for the radiation this is the radiation factor can be uh, calculated from different kinds of equation that is a Nardstein equation Lorentz number etc uh, this is a carbon aerogel also has electrical properties electrochemical properties and gas transport properties which is uh, determined by the um, equation uh, called the cosine karman equation this uh, also have some uh, mechanical and optical properties as well as these are some applications of carbon aerogels uh, as i have said that and nowadays hydrogen storage application and uh, 
electrochemical double layer capacitors that is called super capacitors is a huge uh, new advantage of this kind of carbon aerogels so this is as uh, some conclusions is a uh, processes uh, high porosity high surface area as i have told and uh, this is uh, some unique backbone density which uh, it uh, from by which it can be differed from the normal conventional aerogels that is the silica aerogels or etc these are some references and thank you well uh, uh, i don't see any questions though uh, okay so let us see uh there is uh, no question so we'll, uh, thank you for the presentation sir i have no question oh you have okay go ahead let me see i don't see ha sujit sujit yes yes i would like to know what about the silicon aerogel is it possible Yes, 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 yes. Silicon. Actually, these are some uh, conventional. There is a. Uh, uh, um, if you back from uh, 10, 15 years ago, this is a silica aerogel, silicon aerogel, etc. Are uh, also available. But nowadays, carbon and most um, most importantly, hybrid aerogels. That is, uh, most if eff more effectively than uh, single carbon aerogels. Uh, that is, if you uh, uh, if you. Uh, hybrid from uh, by the silica silicon or any kind of metal uh, with carbon this uh, the basic carbon energy that is a uh, graphene energies or and uh, carbon nanotube energies it will be very much effective uh, in the uh, adsorption purposes that is a uh, wastewater treatment or uh, dye separation etc okay, okay, okay thank you okay we'll stop now okay, we'll go to the next speaker okay we'll not take up the questions anymore uh, okay, uh, uh, who is the next speaker? Hello. Uh, who is the next speaker? I'm Mr. Brother Goswami. Am I audible? Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Sharing my screen. Uh, screen, we don't, so, we don't see yet. Uh, okay. Yes, we see now. Hello. We see now. Okay. Okay. Are my uh, slide visible? Yes, yes, yes. Go ahead. Okay. Hello, I am Mitra Brato Goswami. Uh, I am assistant professor at Hemnali Memorial College of Engineering, Macau. Today, I am presenting an overview of surface plasma resonance (SPR) technique and its applications. So, surface plasma resonance is an optical technique that utilizes for detecting molecular interaction. The binding of the mobile molecules, which are in the analyte, to the molecule of immobile in, uh, in, on a thin metal, uh, which are attached to ligand, uh, changes the refractive index of the film. So, what is plasma? Uh, according to the classical physics approach, can be used to describe plasma. In this analogy, the free electrons uh, in the metal are treated as liquid the entirely composed electron that has been highly density which is called plasma the uh, fluctuation density of appears on the surface of the material are called the plasmons or the surface plasmons each plasmon uh, represents the quantization of the classically oscillation of plasma waves this means the plasmons represents the, the discrete value of the oscillation plasma wave so how does it work? Surface plasma resonance is a phenomenon uh, occurs when the polarized light uh, hits in a, a metal film, which can be gold uh, film, a very very thin film. It is actually very thin film, and uh, at a uh, interface of media with different refractive index. SPR technique is a uh, excite with detect collective oscillation of free electron, known as uh, the surface plasmons, which I mentioned earlier. The light focused onto the metal film uh, through the glass and the prism of the subsequent uh, reflection is de de detected. At a certain incident angle, uh, which is called the resonance angle, the plasmons are set uh, to resonate with light, resulting in absorption of the light at the angle. This is uh, create a dark line in the re uh, reflected beam. 
the resonance angle can be obtained by the uh, observing a reflectivity of the curve of the present molecular binding uh, in event uh, event uh, taking place near the metal film or a confocal change in the molecular bond to the film by monitoring the shift versus time the researcher can study the molecular binding event and the binding kinetics without any hassle of level so coming to the setup of the apparatus here is a uh, here is a thin film we can see a uh, metal thin film uh, and uh, here is a uh, helium neon laser light falling uh, at uh, 632.8 uh, nanometer uh, onto the thin film after the reflection we are collecting the light uh, collecting the light in the cctv camera sensor and the whole apparatus is the rotating apparatus i would like to mention here the angle of uh, falling here is this theta so uh, as i mentioned earlier the surface of the plasmon resonance excited at the metal the dielectric interface the mono uh, it is a monochromatic light uh, for uh, and polarized light beam uh, such as the helium uh, neon laser beam the uh, surface plasmon uh, is a uh, sensitive to uh, changes in environment near the in, uh, interface and the, therefore the poten uh, potential in sensing the probe the sensitivity detection method that are monitors the variation of the thickness and the refractive index of the uh, ultra thin films here's another uh, diagram of the sps setup so here is a polarized polar, uh, polarized light uh, coming through the prism and falling in the uh, surface of the thin metal film and reflected after falling uh, and here is additionally uh, uh, additionally here are a flow channel where uh, ligand are bound binding with the receptors so the what is the uh, total internal reflection in uh, spr uh, when the light hits uh, a half of the circular prism we we can use the circular prism also in the in this setup uh the light bend towards the plane in the interface when uh, passing to the denser medium with a uh, less dense one changing uh, the incident angle which is theta changes the uh, outcoming light until the uh, it reaches the critical angle at the point all the incoming lights are reflected to the circular prism it is called the total internal reflection so what is the uh, evanescent wave in uh, spr in uh, total internal reflection uh, the re reflected photons created a electric field on the opposite side of the interface of the plasmons create a compatible field of uh, field of uh, field that extended onto the medium either side of the film um, the field is called the uh, evanescent field wave so uh, because the field amplitude uh, wave uh, decreases exponentially uh, with the increasing of distance from the interface of the surface and decaying over the distance about the light wave so here is a diagram that uh, indicates that uh, at at a angle beta where we, where are we getting the 100% um, where we are getting the lesser lesser intensity of the light and uh, and at at the angle alpha we are getting the 100% intensity of the light so in the in this uh, rotating spr setup Mm, in the rotating the systematic uh, experimental setup for uh, the surface resonance uh, ex excitation of the sen sensor chip of the gold coating places in the hemisphere the polarized light shines with the light source and the sensor chip and measure the uh, disk at the at the certain angle theta the excitation uh, plasmons occurs here we can see the uh, shift or uh, due to the binding of the uh, began to began with the receptor in the surface plasmon resonance here here is another uh, dark band uh, dark band uh, due to the angular shift the dark band is moving uh, with time so metals that we can use the uh, gold and silver mostly commonly used the uh, aluminum copper can also be suitable here two con uh, configuration are mostly used that is auto configuration and christman configuration configuration Uh, among those kitman configuration is most acceptable because uh, in auto configuration there is a, a certain amount of gap where we consist uh, amount of air which uh, we we can we, we need to eliminate in the uh, in the recording of the in the intensity of the light uh, so in this in this setup we don't need this so what are the application of this 
uh, absorption and desorption kinetics and the biomolecular structure and the uh, protein uh, protein structure and the virus structure and antigen antibody reaction with the epitope mapping non specific biomolecular interaction and tissue engineering so coming to the immunoassay the bio, uh, biochemical test uh, measures the level of the particular molecular biological samples such as the uh, serum and urine uh, we use the antibody reaction to its antigen on specific binding clinically important that the identically uh, pathogen that is the um, prostate specific antigen uh, highly specific to the biomarker when we come to the monoclonal antibody it binds when only when the site of particular antigen hence with the specific and the activate so another part is uh, we can uh, do the polyclonal antibody the het heterogeneous mixture of the uh, antibody against the different epitope of the antigen so here here is the setup of immuno immuno assay coming uh, here are the light coming from the coming to the mitra 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 your time is over your time is over okay okay i'm concluding sir Uh, some advantage and disadvantage. We are uh, improve our the the setup via coupling with AFM and the mass spectroscope. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we don't see any questions. Mr. Prado, we don't see any questions. So okay, thank you very much for the presentation. We will go to the uh, next speaker. Okay, the problem is the last speaker. Yes. Right. Yes, sir. Okay. I like to join it. Join the board. Join it. Are you ready? Okay, good. Yes, sir. Okay. Ah. Uh, so we can see. Ah, uh, we can sir, see sir, the uh, presentation. Yes. Uh, I can please. So because I can't see anything. Oh yes. But uh, okay. we see we see we see your uh, first uh, uh, mm -hmm. slides from mm -hmm. Jacob University, right? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, fine. Go on. Start speaking uh, uh, in uh, you know seven to eight minutes. Okay, okay, sir. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for KCD Government College Conference Organizing Committee for giving me the opportunity to present my recent work. So I'm going to talk about multinucleate transition metal containing <coughs> heteropoly tungsten and their associated properties. Before going to discuss about this, I would like to give my outline of the talk. In this talk, <laughs> so can anyone uh, going to uh, operate my slides, please? Hello? Hello? Uh, have you instructed anybody to operate your slides? Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, someone replied me. Uh, they will operate anyway. Okay, so, Sukuba, can you, Sukuba, can you, uh, Romo, can you? Uh, yes, they replied me. Yeah. Yes, sir. I am operating, sir. I am operating. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. So uh, we were going to talk. I would like to give the outline of my talk. This is the brief introduction and why polynuclear co coordination complexes use at a precursor. And then I will talk about the tetramanganese three containing heteropoly tungsten and their properties like magnetic and XPS and the iron 48 containing also heteropoly tungsten. And finally, I will con talk, conclude my talk. So what is polyoxometallate? Polyoxometallate are the metal oxygen clusters and <coughs> formed by <coughs> a high valent ox uh, the metal addenda atom like tungsten, molybdenum plus six, and <coughs> um, niobium, vanadium, and tantalum, they are plus five oxidation state. These metal ions form the octahedral in the acetic medium, and these octahedral can be connected by each other by corner sharing or edge sharing and the face sharing. So, depending on the heteroatom, this polyoxometallate classified as heteropolytungstate and isopolytungstate. Heteropolytungstate has the central heteroatoms like silicon, phosphorus arsenic, germanium, but isopoly don't have any heteroatoms. So how does the polyoxometallate form? 
So polyoxymetal lets form the tetrahedral metal oxide when acidified in aqueous solutions, it forms the octahedral geometry. And then further condense depending on heteroatom. If no heteroatom, this isopoly like linguist paratungstate, or um, if they are heteroatom, it is oil Dawson and Kagin ions. We are interested on oil Dawson heteropoly phospho tungstate because this from this precursor we can make the any other precursor like P2W15 Kagin ions or P2W12 Kagin ion. <coughs> Kagin ion. Please, can you operate someone because uh, nobody can uh, see these slides. Yeah. And uh, these lig uh, ligands can act as a multi-dented nature and possess various coordination binding modes that possible to form the multinuclear cluster. And those clusters are effective for the um, magnetic and catalytic application. <coughs> So um, uh, uh, now, as I told before, that why polynuclear metal clusters are used as a coordination complex precursor to interact polyoxo metal it? because there are a huge number of polynuclear coordination complexes known, and the interaction with coordination complexes with polyoxo metal it are not explored. And this approach leads to the isolation of very unexpected structure with interesting properties. And <clears throat> which type of material cannot be prepared from simple or any other metal salt with interact with the form precursor. Here I am showing some uh, last uh, decades, uh, there is some interesting precursor people use for the isolation of form clusters like dodeca nuclear uh, manganese acetate with central four manganese are plus four oxidation state and spherical all are plus three state and this complex shows the very interesting magnetic property single molecule magnet which is the very hot topic in the current research and utilize these speakers are form group and 2012 reported the heptanuclear uh, <coughs> heteropoly tungstate which is contains mixed valent manganese three and four and the tetradecan nuclear manganese phosphor tungstate also both complex shows the single molecule magnetic behavior and based on this background we have synthesized the tetranuclear manganese phosphor tungstate in 60 40 volume acetic acid water and these pores shows the rhombic like tetra core and their um, axial bond of the manganese o52 and o54 are too longer and this is shows the young pillar bistar side the oxidation state of the manganese atoms further confirmed by the XPA study, which reveals that the bottom one is the um, manganese 3 acetate and top one is our compound, so which is perfectly matched and that indicates the all manganese are plus 3 state. The solution state also confirmed by the phosphorus enamel study, which indicates that uh, too far from the manganese atom, the second phosphorus is so minus 12 ppm. <coughs> The magnetic study indicates that at decrease the temperature, KIT value decreases, which indicates the antiferromagnetic coupling, but supposed to show the interesting magnetic property due to lack of the anisotropic factor, it does not show interesting magnetic property. And this is the corresponding IR peak. We generally first characterize how compounds form. And the uh, there is some phosphorus oxygen peak at 1087 and other peaks corresponding tungsten oxygen and this is the pga curve which shows the continuous water loss and the other oxygen and iron 48 containing heteropoly tungstate here i would like to give the brief outline of this why we did this um, isolate this compound in 2005 Gordon at all reported the 28 iron containing heteropoly tungstate and this compound has uh, the adamant and center pole after that, still now, there is no report any higher nuclearity of iron containing phosphotungstate in polyoxo metallate complexes. So we thought that why we cannot use the P from transition metal complexes. So based on this, we choose the iron 28 tungsten uh, um, polynuclear complex because this complex has unique tube and core and it is easy synthesized water soluble. 
and we have uh, performed the reaction with iron 22 with heteropolyphospho tungsten and isolate the uh, 48 iron containing macrocyclic complex this is the highest number of iron center containing phospho tungsten known to date the if you alternate view of this iron 48 it looks like a chair conformation of cyclooctane and this inner core dimension of the iron 48 is the highest inner core 24 degree 13 angstrom and if you visualize the core structure you can see that it um, trigon triangular iron 3 oxo core and trigonal piezometric um, uh, iron oxo core are present in this structure and magnetic study also indicates that it uh, anti ferromagnetic coupling because decrease the temperature kt value decreases but due to lack of long range ordering in this complex it does not show the single molecule magnetic behavior but it supposed to show good magnetic behavior due to high number of iron and high spin ground state <coughs> so this is also the same basic characteristic of ir spectra which indicates compound form and tga shows that the at um, 230 degree centigrade temperature its weight loss is 19% this corresponds to the 400 crystal waters molecule and now i am going to conclude my talk that we have synthesized and structurally characterized tetramanganese three containing phospho tungstate and it is a weakly type sandwich structure and rhombic core xps data confirms the plus oxidation state of the manganese ions and solution stability confirmed by the phosphorus enamel study magnetic study indicated anti ferromagnetic coupling of the manganese ions with between the oxo bridge and we have isolated very large uh, disk in 96 phospho tungstate containing iron 48 clusters and this is the highest number of the iron center known to date and magnetic study indicate the anti ferromagnetic coupling between the iron center so i would like to acknowledge my postdoctoral host professor ulrich kor and all of my collaborators and jacobs university for in infrastructure and facilities and dfg for funding and finally i thank to my family for support doing the postdoctoral research here and thank you all of you for your kind attention and finally also i would like to again thank the kcd government college for giving me opportunity to present this my work and any questions are welcome uh, uh, well uh, uh, joy day we don't see any questions probably most of us are um, uh, hungry for lunch you know yeah yeah okay Uh, so uh, that's why probably people are uh, reluctant to uh, ask questions to you. But any case, your presentation is very good. I thought you are working with uh, Professor Royski. Uh, I worked before. I be, I be oh, okay. Before. Because I, I can, I can, I can, I can uh, compare the work. You know. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay. So tomorrow, now it's over to you. Right. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank. Thank. Ah. Why? Okay. Thank you, Professor Mal, for chairing the session. Thank you, Professor Bhattacharya and Professor Mal for reviewing the oral presentations. We will announce the name of three best oral presenters today in the WhatsApp group after collecting the review result from our reviewers. Uh, now we are at the last part, that is the validatory session of our international webinar. hope you have enjoyed all the sessions uh, it is the time for delivering vote of thanks for this i like to call dr niloy kumar moitro coordinator of iqsc government general degree college keshari sir please Nilada Nilada Can you hear me?
uh, please wait. Uh, Nilada has a technical problem, so he's again joining. So, I leave now, okay? Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have sent you. I have sent you the uh, marks. Okay, sir. okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. So, I am leaving. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. I am leaving. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Sir. okay. Hello, Dilata. Hello, Dilata. Simultaneously, phone take a login for a chista put the bar in. Sorry, sorry for being late. Uh, uh, some of the technical glitch will not allow me to contact you, uh, you through my computer. So uh, let's start. Good afternoon to all of you. It is a great honor for me to have the opportunity to conclude the two-day international webinar entitled Chemistry in Motivation in Research on behalf of the college, organizing committee, and IQAC. First of all, we are indebted to Almighty that all of us who have participated in this webinar are in sound health and for the successful completion of this webinar during such a strange situation of COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, I would like to thank the eminent speakers, Professor Indrujit Sharma, Professor Topun Kanti Pine, Professor Onindo Dotto, and Dr. Oshit Patro, who have spared their valuable time to 
give motivational talks to enlighten the young minds. Our heartiest thanks to Professor Deepak Ranjan Mal and Professor Shubhash Chandra Bhattacharya for dignifying our college by their presence as reviewer and chair the sessions. I thank the paper presenters and participants for this webinar for showing their interest. A gratitude to the officer in charge, Dr. Shudipto Chakraborty, whose enthusiasm and foresightedness always imbue us to work for the excellence of this college. The grand success of this webinar is incomplete if we won't remember the names of two teachers of this college. Muhammad Ismail Alamin of Botany Department and Dr. Shomo Shundar Mati of Chemistry Department, who helped in creating this net platform for the webinar. I am thankful to the convener of this webinar, Dr. Shutoparai and Dr. Shomo Shundar Mati, who conceived this and gave us the opportunity to hear such good lectures. The keenness of our teacher council secretary, Sri Indor Mukherjee, stimulates the different committees to work hand in hand. So I thank to both our teachers council secretary and teachers in different committees for their support to make this webinar a grand success. Thank you again for your presence. Uh, okay. okay, now we are at the end of the webinar. Thank you all for being here and having patience. Please give your feedback for today in the form already given in the chat box. Hope we can meet again in future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.